as girl to predict fatigue graph growth and then we're going to do a video demonstration on how to uh, calculate the stress intensity factors uh, or energy release rates which are metrics to, to pre predict fracture using the software abacus so let's go and dive in into this lecture welcome to another exciting lecture uh, today we're going to be discussing the fracture mechanics which is a very significant area of expertise in the design of aircraft, aerospace, launch vehicle applications. Um, so uh, wh why study the area of fracture? Uh, one of the reasons we wanna study the area of fracture is because there are situations where structures have collapsed due to hidden flaws. And so it's very important to gain a fundamental understanding of why this happened. For example, we have a lot of examples. As an example, we have the Aloha Airlines in 1988, where the aircraft lost a third of its roof due to stress fracture. We also have the Liberty ship fracture. Uh, and then we have a, a, a long history of fractures. And here's some, just some examples to think about. But in general, a lot of the structures that have failed are usually initiated at stress concentrations. And we know they're due to hidden flaws because sometimes these stress concentrations have been designed such that they're below the strength or the yield, cap yield capability. Yet, we know that fracture occurs. So we must study why these things occur. And one of the reasons we believe that fracture occurs is due to hidden flaws. That's one possibility. Uh, every structure uh, is, is going to have some internal, you know, some dislocations at the microstructure uh, that could have occurred during the manufacturing process. So uh, in aircraft, there were, there were some une unexpected failures during the 1940s and 1950s, which motivated the dramatic expansion of the research field of fracture mechanics. And so the early research was really limited to linear elastic fracture mechanics. Around 1960s, we began looking at plasticity and how fracture mechanics can be applied to situations where plasticity could occur. So um, a stress-based criteria really helps you define the onset of damage initiation. We discussed this during the discussions of low cycle fatigue, high cycle fatigue and what we want to do is really gain an, an understanding of what will happen if damage had initiated what happens with that crack that initiates due to stress concentration will it continue to propagate or or it will remain stable so that is one of the questions we have and another question that could arise is what if i have a distribution of flaws they are uh, below the inspection limit. Perhaps visually you cannot see any flaws. Perhaps by applying non-destructive evaluation techniques, such as dye penetrant or some other technique, we cannot see these flaws, but they're there. How do you deal with those? And so that's some of the questions we have to answer. And fracture mechanics is a very handy way of assessing that. Um, and here's an example of a crack that may have formed due to low cycle or high cycle fatigue. That's a potential. And then that crack that formed should be assessed for fracture. And the question is, can that crack continue to propagate? Uh, is it stable? Is it unstable? And so forth. So that's number one. Number two, the other question we want to answer is, I have a stress concentration based on the high cycle and low cycle fatigue designs it should not have initiated a crack but yet it did perhaps my analysis was wrong to begin with or perhaps there was an incipient flaw from manufacturing and that could have been from the machining of this hole or this uh, window um, but in general we're looking for reasons why uh, that could have happened and that's where fracture mechanics could help close that gap so what is the importance of fracture mechanics? And we, we kind of discussed that through a few examples, and I won't go 
I didn't go through extensive details through those examples because I think there's a significant amount of that information in, in the literature. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight the main points. But all real materials can have the potential of containing defects. And so um, that for, for that reason, we need to understand the influence of defects on the strength of the material. And that's where the defect tolerant design philosophy comes from. And the idea is, is, is to, um, hey, you know, should we, should we be assessing the design by assuming a defect is present in the part? Uh, this is relevant for fatigue because, you know, you could have the initiation and growth of fatigue cracks. And so those initiation points, which are now cracks, need to be evaluated as discussed earlier. There are two approaches that I'll be discussing today. One is based on the energy approach, and the other one is the rigorous mechanics approach. I want to revisit a little bit some um, um, nomenclature here. Uh, we have ductile materials, and ductile materials will, e will exhibit extensive plastic deformation, and so you have significant amount of energy absorption before final fracture. Brittle materials, on the other hand, have very little plastic deformation and they have low energy absorption before fracture. Fraction, what is fracture? What is fracture really? And fracture is really the creation of new surfaces within the body. And steps in this fracture prop process involve the creation of a crack and propagation. And so, for example, take a piece of paper, handy, in your hands now, and maybe it's a piece of paper you want to throw away, but take that piece of paper, and uh, now, as you can see, it has four sides to that paper. Uh, but if I were now to break that paper in half, I have created new surfaces that not, did not exist previously. And so that is a fracture process. It's the creation of new surfaces within the body. Fracture can be ductile or brittle, and I discussed the definition of ductile versus brittle. Um, a ductile fracture will occur in most metals, uh, usually not in situations where the metal is too cold. Um, and ductile fracture usually involves extensive plastic deformation ahead of the crack tip. I'll be discussing this a little bit more in detail later on. Crack can be stable in these scenarios, uh, and it will resist further extension unless we continue to apply stress. And the reason is because of this plastic deformation that forms ahead of the crack tip, it creates a zone where you have an increased overall fracture toughness there. Brittle failure, such as ceramics, glass, coal metals, involve the small plastic zone or sp small plastic deformation. And the crack is usually unstable and propagates rapidly without increase in applied stress. Here is a micrograph of a ductile fracture, and you can see the fine nature of uh, the microstructure. Here in the brittle fracture, you can see a more coarse behavior. And then when you go to creep fracture, you see a significant amount of non uniformity on the surfaces of on the fracture surface. Uh, when it comes to fatigue fracture, instead of seeing this kind of behavior, you're going to see something like beach marks. This was discussed extensively in the previous lecture in relationship to fatigue. So what is the focus today? The focus today is fracture mechanics. And one book that I recommend highly for you to purchase, if you plan to work in this area, is the Fracture Mechanics book by Anderson. And this book goes into extensive details from the fundamentals all the way to areas that we won't have time to cover. But that is okay. Today's lecture is meant to give you a fundamental understanding of linear elastic fracture mechanics. The extension to linear elastic fracture mechanics beyond this point is not very difficult to do. And so I invite you to go ahead and buy this book and go through chapter through chapter.
one of the questions that we want to answer ourselves is when can I really use linear elastic fracture mechanics? As you can see, we have linear elastic fracture mechanics, we have elastic plastic fracture mechanics, and then we have a variety of modeling that can be done. As you increase the load in a structure, um, that load um, is going to uh, be such that there's a point at which the structure will fail. So if we call that the failure stress, so there's a flaw and there's a stress, and we increase the stress to the point that fracture occurs. I'll call that the failure stress when that happens. If I plot the failure stress versus fracture toughness, what really happens is that with low values of fracture, low values of fracture toughness, as the fracture toughness increases, and I'll discuss this more so it'll be, become more apparent why failure stress is related to fracture toughness. At the moment, think of fracture toughness as a parameter that describes the resistance of the material to fracture. So obviously, if I have a higher resistance to fracture the structure, the higher stress I need to make that fracture to occur. So it does make sense that at low values of fracture, uh, you will require less stress. As I increase the fracture toughness, the resistance to fracture is increasing, and so the failure stress that is required, the stress that's required to fail the structure also increases. And there's a, and, and for low values, generally low values, uh, linear elastic fracture mechanics applies because the behavior tends to be brittle. It, it tends to be brittle. Um, as you go to higher values of fracture toughness, um, you'll often find they start to get into area called nonlinear fracture mechanics. And so the failure stress increases less, uh, so it's not a in significant increase, but what happens there is that you have to start looking at something like elastic plastic fracture mechanics. So keep this in mind as I go through this lecture so that it's clear what are we trying to accomplish. And so again, today's lecture, is focused on linear elastic fracture mechanics. I will show some possible extensions to account for some amount of plasticity. So what is the big picture? What is the big picture? And so given a structure, given a flaw, given loads, when is this structure gonna fail? And so, Look at this as the outline of today's presentation. But the first step is really to discuss what is the stress intensity factor? What is K1? That's what I'm going to focus on in the next uh, third or half of this presentation. And then once we figure that out, and I will show you that the stress intensity factor really describes that stress concentration field. And so this stress concentration factor for which is for a sharp crack is directly related to the stress that you apply is related to the flaw size and if you want to determine whether fracture occurs the stress intensity factor must be less than a material property that we call the material fracture toughness so as you can see there's several things at play that tell me when fracture occurs the stress intensity factor the stress as applied, and the crack length, and then you have the material fracture toughness. It's important to understand that all of this needs to be considered uh, simultaneously. And so we're gonna start first discussing what is stress intensity factor? Because perhaps it's the first time that you've ever seen this. So let's go back to the stress concentrations for elliptical hull, and we derived in previous lectures, how to come up with a stress field for an elliptical hole. And for that, uh, we can derive that using the equation for the ellipse and using concepts that are based on the area stress function. And today's lecture, we're not going to dive deep into those derivations. But I want you to realize that uh, there are certain conditions when uh, you you, you will get a sharp crack instead of an elliptical uh, hole. And those conditions are driven by the uh, minor and the major axis of this elliptical hole. 
To accomplish that, to get a sharp crack, you have to set alpha equals zero. And when you do that, you recover a, a crack. And so uh, when we look at this solution for uh, the stress field in a, for an elliptical hole, we find that the stress components are given by this expression. And at the whole surface, at the whole surface, at this surface, we can look at what is going on. The maximum stress occurs at this point when the loading is applied top and bottom. And so when I look at that stress field, that stress field it is stress times one plus two A over B. And here B is a height of this elliptical hole, twice the height, two B is a height, the full height of this elliptical hole. And A in this instance, two A in this instance is a full distance across the elliptical hole. So what I want you to notice is that when this radius of curvature, when this radius here decreases, uh, it goes to a number such that it's close to zero, which means you recover a sharp crack and this height is zero, and that means B is zero in this case, then the stress intensity factor or the stress concentration factor for a hole goes to infinity. Notice that when A equals B, you recover a circle. And when you have a circular hole, the stress concentration for that is three, which is what was derived in the stress concentration lecture. It is important to understand that the analysis for elliptical holes will lend itself to higher and higher stress when B decreases relative to A, which means that this height is becoming smaller and smaller to the point that it becomes a sharp crack. When that happens, B is increasing, and so therefore the stress concentration is increasing. And when B becomes zero, you have a sharp crack and you have an infinite stress. So again, it's very important to understand that um, it becomes quite complex on how to approach uh, this problem. Because if you have an infinite stress, how you determine whether, when the structure fails? Because it doesn't matter what amount of stress I apply, I can apply one PSI, 10 PSI, 100 PSI, this stress here will be infinite. And so obviously, those stresses you know, are not gonna cause failure necessarily. So we have to figure out a different way to predict in failure. And so that's where we have to start studying the stress field. What is the stress field really doing due to very sharp crack tip? Here's a list of references I think you should download because I think it will provide you a history and understanding of linear elastic fracture mechanics. And the key players here are Inglis, Griffith, uh, Erwin, and Paris. Okay, so please uh, download those papers and go through that. Here's a, a, another two papers that I think um, we really wanna go through because they found the basis for the solution that was developed for understanding the stress field around a crack tip. And so I'm gonna go through some mathematical derivations, but that's important to really understand the idea of the stress intensity factor. So consider a body under stress equilibrium. Normally, you're using Newton's law where the summation forces the summation of forces equals MA. That's what we all have heard. Summation of forces equals MA. But for a body of material, subject to traction forces that have appropriate boundary conditions, accelerations, and body forces, Newton's law can be generalized to be such as the integral of the body forces, dV, plus the tractions applied to the body, dS, equals the integral of the density times acceleration dV. Notice how this volume term is required because acceleration acts on every point in this particle, in this body, and the density also 
could be non-uniform. Assuming that the density is uniform, then, and the acceleration is uniform across the body, then this becomes MA. But notice, because the integral of rho dv is mass. And so it's important to understand that this is really force equals MA, but it's a more general version because we're looking at how these forces and how the tractions and how the body forces and density could vary across the body. Note how here in this case, uh, uh, you, in the left hand side, you have the body force applied. This body force times the volume quantity is a force quantity. And this traction, which is a PSI or force per length squared, is applied over the surface. You can only apply forces over the surface. And so when I do the integral of that respect to ds, the surface that, be, that we're integrating our, uh, uh, by, uh, that also give me, gives me units of force. So in reality, summation of forces equals ma still stands. But this is a little more general because we're looking at um, a volume of material rather than a rigid body. And so I want to point out some, some interesting things that we can do. We can uh, relate distraction forces to quantities inside the body. Distraction forces are quantities you can, you, can ex, you can apply externally to the body. But what really fractures the body are internal quantities that may exceed their metrics. For example, stress is a quantity that develops internal to the structure that reacts these external forces, these traction forces are being applied. As a consequence, it is important to me that I take these tractions and I figure out what the stresses are inside this body, because if I can do that, I can then determine whether fracture will occur. And so that's what we've done here. We've converted this traction quantity into stress quantity but inside the body of the material. And then we use the divergence theorem to relate this to the volume, because this is a surface integral. It's important to me to understand what's going on with the stresses inside the body. And so I have a normal here because the stress inside the body, just, uh, just outside, just inside the surface, right inside the surface, the, the stress is right in there times the normal to that surface has to be equal to the tractions. And so here, uh, that's what we've done. We converted the traction to a stretch just outside this, inside the surface with a normal that corresponds to where the tractions are applied. And then I can use the divergence theorem to equate it to a volume integral. Notice how this is the gradient of the stress. Now, if you're wondering what these eyes are, it is a, called the Euler's notation or index notation here. And here you see actually three equations. So summation forces equals MA is really three equations. Summation forces in the X, in the Y, and the Z. So this I really varies from one to three. So this equation is true for I equals one. And then our axis here, X1 is this way. And then the second equation is i equals 2. And so that's y equals x2, so this coordinate. And then the third equation is i equals 3, which corresponds to the equation in the third direction, x3. So it's important to understand that this equation represents three equations. And what we've done here is we have expanded on this one, because what we really want to do is tractions applied outside the surface of the material, like drag, lift. These are things you can apply. Need to be related to stresses inside the body. And as a consequence, we've made this transformation here or this relationship. And so this is just true statement. Now that I have it in terms of stress, I can now convert this into volume integral. What I wanna point out is that this is a fairly powerful conversion from surface integral to volume integral. And the reason for that is, because we've taken a quantity that's acting on the surface and we made it true to act on the volume at every point in the body of the material. In other words, if I know sigma ij nj on the surface, 
I know exactly how the gradient of stress varies inside the body. And this is what this is really saying here. So if I substitute this expression by that, then I get this equation here. For no acceleration, we can drop that term. And so then we get this equation here. This equation here, since the integral of volume applies to both terms, then sigma ij comma j plus bi equals zero. And so in reality, there's three equations here again. So for each i, i equals one, uh, and then you have a j repeated here. What that really means is summation of this expression from j equals one to three. We have expanded it here in x, y, and z, so you can see the three equations laid out for you. But this has to be, these three equations are the result, they're the full result of Newton's second law, but integral form. And so these are the fundamental equations of elasticity, and they're required in solving mechanics problems. Uh, and we're going to be using these equations to solve the stress field near the crack tip. So if we look at the elasticity equations in 2D, we don't have to consider the third row, the, th the third term, or the third equation. And so we can just simplify it like that. And there's this idea of every stress function, which I want to introduce. If I assume a function P of this kind, you will notice how um, if I were to plug in sigma xx, sigma yy, and tau xy in this manner, then the equations fully satisfy the elasticity equations exactly. So phi in this manner is a physical solution to the problem. You can see that here. If I plug this into this term, and I plug this into that term, and I plug this into this term and that term, you'll notice how it goes equal to zero. And so that is good news because I have figured out how to solve these two 2D equations using something called the airy stress function, meaning I have made an assumption of sigma xx, sigma yy, tau xy, such that I have a full satisfaction of these elasticity equations. And it turns out that when I use the equations of elasticity and I involve the kinematic relationships or the stress deflection relationships, and the strain deflection relationships, I'll find that phi must satisfy this equation as well, or the biharmonic equation needs to be satisfied. Meaning, I found phi such that, I haven't found phi, but I found a form of sigma xx, sigma yy, tau xy that fully satisfies these equations, exactly, these two equations. And then yet, I'm able to then, uh, have a, a partial differential equation that can be solved for. Uh, and if, if I can solve for phi, then can I, find, I can find the stress fields of interest. And so if I go to look at uh, what Westergaard did to solve this problem, he considered a complex stress function. So let's think about that for a second. I, I don't want you to um, get confused, but a complex stress function usually has a real part and a imaginary part. And a complex stress function, um, usually um, z here, so z is a function and small z is a complex number. Um, if a complex function is a function of a complex number, it's possible to find the real part of z and the imaginary part of z. So that was the idea that Westergaard had to solve this problem. And so I want to point out to, to some Couch's uh, Riemann relationships for complex variables. So for example, the real part of the first derivative of z, respect to small z, is really the derivative of the real part of z, respect to x, which is also equal to the derivative of the imaginary part of z, respect to y. So these are just identities that can be proven, but we won't prove it here. Uh, you could find the proofs in various papers and books, and books, but today we're going to focus on, on some uh, top level understanding. So I don't want anybody in this lecture to get riled up with the mathematics, but I think it's important to really derive these equations so you understand what stress intensity factor really means.
So please, big picture perspective, I have, so let me back up so it's understanding, we're understanding what we're trying to do. We have a crack here, and the stress is infinite at this point. And I want to figure out a way, if I apply a stress in the far field, how can I predict failure if this stress is infinite? It doesn't matter what stress I apply, I will have an infinite stress here. And so that makes it very difficult for me to predict failure. Maybe there's a better way. There's a, maybe there's a, an approach I can use to, to move forward here. And one of the approaches is to, to understand the stress field around the crack tip, which is what we're trying to do. And to figure out the stress solution around the crack tip, we have to recur to some mechanics. And what we did, we used the Newton's law integral form, and we demonstrated that these are the equilibrium equations of elasticity. And for 2D, we have dropped the third term and the third equation, and so we're left with this. And I showed you that by assuming a form of first stress that looks like this, I can then substitute this into these equilibrium equations and demonstrate that it fully satisfies the elasticity equations. And then I also have pointed to you, and I've skipped the derivation, but that then, then the governing equation then becomes the biharmonic equation, which can be found from the compatibility equations for the deflections, the strain deflection relationships. So this was covered uh, in the stress concentration lecture, but I'm bringing that up again today. And so how, and so what I'm trying to discuss now is how to deal with uh, how Westergaard approached it. And so again, he assumed a stress function, but I have to discuss some identities that will become important later. The imaginary part of the derivative of z respect to z can be found as the derivative of the imaginary part of z respect to x, which is the minus of the real part of z respect to y. Uh, so that's, that's really important. Uh, the derivative of z respect to z, so this derivative here, is also the real part of the derivative of z respect to z in this manner, plus i times the imaginary part of the derivative of z respect to small z. So that's an important relationship um, that needs to be addressed. So because of that, we can now expand upon this using these, these identities. So the derivative of this, this one here was found here at the top, so I can substitute it as that one. So that one is that one. And then plus i, and then we found what this is. So this part was found uh, as that right here. And also, that's in terms of x, but we can also make it equal uh, in terms of y. So that's, this is also equal to that. And this is also, uh, these two are also equal, okay? And so I'll continue here with some additional identities here. So I want to I wanna make, make a, a a, some definitions here. And th there's nothing fancy here, so just pay attention to this. I'm going to define the derivative of z double bar dz as z bar. And then the derivative of z bar respect to small z as z. And the derivative of z respect to small z as z prime. This is done purely for convenience, just for convenience, okay? So again, these are just definitions. If you uh, you know, see z bar anywhere, you know that's the derivative of z double bar dz. If you see z anywhere, that's the derivative of z bar dz. And then if you see z prime, that's the derivative of z respect to small z. And remember, z is a function, a complex function, and small z is a coordinate, x plus i y. Okay. So this is what Westergaard did, okay, backing up. Westergaard chose the area stress function phi as a real part of the stress function z double bar plus y imaginary part of z bar. Now, I'm not asking you to figure out, figure out how he did it. Um, I mean, he, he worked on this for years to figure this out. So for you, what is important is to understand that this is what he can, this is the area stress function he used. And again, this area stress function phi is the one that automatically satisfies the equations of elasticity and what you're really trying to solve is the biharmonic equation. And so by assuming this area stress function of this manner, um, now I can take, and note, note 
that sigma xx, sigma yy, and tau xy require the second derivative of phi respect to y, second derivative of phi respect to x, second derivative of phi respect to x and y, and as a consequence, that forces me to find the derivative of phi respect to y, as you can see. I have to do that calculation. And the derivative of phi respect to y uh, then becomes the derivative of the real part of z double bar, and then the derivative of this respect to uh, y, okay? And so you'll quickly notice that I have to go back to the relationships we discussed to be able to proceed forward. I want to point out that the z he selected had this form. Very important to realize. So this is a z that he selected. Uh, a is a crack length, and z is a complex variable. Um, uh, and it's a coordinate, x plus i, y. And so something very important to realize there is that that's a z that he selected, and this phi here um, was selected in this manner. So when you, if you use uh, these expressions at the top, and you use these identities that we just discussed, all these identities here, which I don't want to go into extensive details because my point is to walk you through top level, and feel free to pause the video right now and see if you can derive these expressions. And uh, let, me, let me let you pause the video. Okay, for those that don't want to pause the video, continue watching. Uh, but for those that pause the video and got it right, congratulations for being the king of complex numbers. But this derivative here, here, can be found. Um, and when you walk through all these relationships that I discussed, this is what you get. Uh, the real part of z minus y, imaginary part of z prime, real part of z plus y, imaginary part of z prime, and then tau x, y is minus y times real part of z prime. So very three uh, st stresses found as a function of z, and z is given by this function here. And it's very cool that we were able to simplify uh, to that manner. So something I want to point out, if I want to look at the boundary conditions at the crack plane at y equals zero, we're looking here at this plane here. So y equals zero is that plane. If I set y equals zero in these equations here, y goes to zero, y goes to zero, I get this real part of z, real part of z, and this tau x y goes to zero. So that's what's going on at y equals zero. That's what the crack plane of interest is. Um, at z equals x, so uh, we get, uh, so when, when y equals zero, since z equals x plus i, y, uh, since z equals x plus i, y, then at y equals zero, z becomes x, small z. So you can quickly see here how this z becomes x. And for that, for, for that reason, the real part of z and the real part of z for sigma x, x and sigma y, y both become just this quantity. So very interesting that both of those stresses in those two directions are equal. Um, uh, uh, you know, and, and also we realize here that um, at x equals a, uh, which is right at this crack tip, I get an infinite stress too. So something to notice there, okay? Um, so notice how the crack tip, the stress goes to infinite. And the idea is to study the stress field near the crack tip. So recall that by using the area stress function, uh, these are the three stresses we stress components in terms in terms of z that we found. And that uh, note how we re, so how these z calculations are required for the stress field here. So again, this is very general. Now I'm looking away from the crack tip surface. I'm looking at the at the area surrounding the crack tip, and notice how the stress field requires a z, this real part of z being calculated, and, and how it requires the calculator for z prime. So all this is required due to the stress field shown here. And then the idea there then was let's assume instead of using x plus i y, let's why we don't use z equals a plus r e i to the theta, which means I'm looking at this crack tip and I'm looking around that crack tip and I'm using polar coordinate systems. And that's 
that's very neat because if I can do it this way, perhaps these calculations here will be more manageable. And I'm, I'm, I'll be able to get somewhere with this stress field. And so uh, something to consider here is that uh, now I can use this and plug it in into this small z and that z and so forth, expand it and find a stress field as a function of r according uh, according r and theta. Notice here, a is known, that's half of the crack length, and then r and theta, r is the radius and theta corresponds to the angle. And so we're looking at near the crack tape, what's, what is going on. So using polar coordinate systems, I need to put that z into this polar coordinate system, and I've done that here. A plus R E I to the theta, I expand it here significantly. And when you expand here, what I want you to do is take pause the video, di divide the top portion by A squared, and divide the bottom portion by A squared. And anything that where uh, R over A is too small in the denominator, denominator uh, you want to eliminate. And so uh, I encourage you to do that uh, because we're going to be using that uh, moving forward. That simplification. This is usually accurate for r over a less than 0.1. But that makes sense because the crack length usually is very large compared to the area that we're trying to examine. And so uh, this fundamental assumption um, is not a bad one to make at this point in time. And so uh, now that you've paused the video and, and looked at this, uh, tell me if you're able to get from here to here. So again, I pause the video. And if you did, congratulations again for being a king in the, um, making uh, simplifications. And so if I divide the, divide the top by a squared, r over a will be squared and r over a is small because a is much bigger than r. And so this will go to zero, this term right here. In the denominator, if I divide it by a squared, this is one. And then this term will have r over a, and that's small, so we'll eliminate that. And this will have r over a squared, which is also small, we'll eliminate that. So you're left with two a r, e i to the theta divided by a squared, which is what I divided first. I divided the top by a squared and the bottom by a squared. So this is what we got. A further simplifies, and then z can be written in this manner. Uh, there's a square root, so e i to the theta, the i theta half is because of the square root. And then since it's in the denominator, we bring it to the numerator, and so put a minus sign there. So now how we've simplified, uh, Irwin simplified the Westergaard solution uh, and has related to the stress field. Um, and now, I can go ahead and use Euler's formula, which is e i to the theta, which is cosine phi plus i sine phi. And note, aside, we're, what we're trying to do, big picture perspective, is to find stresses and find those stresses near the crack tip to make it easier for us to understand what is going on. And so um, keep that in mind. So that's what we've been doing the whole time. And so, uh, I have uh, the stress the, the stress function here, which has been simplified to this by making the assumptions I just talked about. So the first step, going to polar co coordinate systems and then making r over a close to zero anytime I encountered it. And then by making that assumption, the z complex function using Euler's formula becomes this here. So what I've done here is applied Euler's formula to the e, uh, e to the minus i theta over half. So that's what we've done there. And so now the real part of that is basically the real part of this, which is just this part here. So that's the real part of z. And notice how this term will be helping us find what this is, which is showing up twice. The sigma xx equals the real part of z, and sigma yy equals the real part of z. So uh, again, again, um, what we found is these terms here, now we have to figure out how to find the z prime terms here on the right hand side. So I have to find the z primes. And so we can continue expanding here. So z prime is this, 
substituting, uh, and remember this z was given earlier as this, the Westergaard function. So I have to find z prime there. Uh, so that's what was done here. And then once I have it in that term, I substitute Euler's formula or the complex function in polar coordinate system, the coordinate, and small z is a plus r e i theta, the same here with that z. And then I expand on this. Once I expand on that, I again make the simplification we talked about earlier. And when we do that, divide everything by a squared and so forth, the way we talked about it. And when I do that, everything simplifies to this. And again, I will try to apply the Euler solution or the Euler's formula to then expand this even further. Okay. Um, and so uh, once we go there, uh, I can now find the real part. Uh, I found the real part of Z already, which is here. And now I can find the imaginary part of this and the real part of this, which is required in these calculations for stress. So again, the imaginary part of Z prime is this coefficient here, sine three theta half times all of this. And then real part uh, is just this first term. So that, that'll go in here. Okay, so it's required. So if I look at stress XX by itself alone, which is this one here, stress XX is this one right here. So I have the real part of Z, which I found in the previous page. I have to find the imaginary part of Z prime, which is uh, basically this coefficient times all this stuff. And so when I expand, I get this. Now I also realize that this can be further simplified into this because uh, we know that y divided by r is really sine theta in polar coordinate systems, and that x over r is cosine theta. So we can use that relationship to further simplify this. We can use some trigonometry identities uh, and, and, and expand sine theta into sine theta over two and cosine theta over two. So that's a trigonometry identity where this one half goes away by doing this transformation. And then you can factor out the cosine theta to have it in this form, okay? And so uh, note that this is what you will get um, by, by um, um, for the stress field around the crack tip, actually. And uh, so that, that is a solution for the stress. And we've, we've accomplished quite a bit by doing that. You can do the same thing for sigma yy and tau xy. The bottom line is a stress field is going to look like something on the right hand side. That's how it looks like uh, with a high stress at, at that very tip. And so um, it, is, it is very common uh, in this area of expertise to multiply in this square root, root to put a pi there. So you have pi A and then a two pi R at the bottom. And so that's why you see a pi there and a pi there. It's customary to do that. Um, and so note now, so when I set theta equals zero, I'm looking at that crack plane. So I'm looking at this crack plane. And when R equals zero, I'm looking right at the crack tip. So what is going on when I have theta uh, equals zero? So this becomes one, and this is zero. This becomes one, this becomes zero. And note how these two are equal. This becomes zero. And so you're really left with these two stresses at the crack tip. And notice how when R um, takes the value of zero at the crack tip, this becomes infinite. And I can take the top term and call that K, okay? And the bottom term, square root of two pi R, will stay there. And then this F, G, and H functions, we're gonna just call them uh, just uh, some functions, okay? Uh, bottom line here, this k right here, which I have made equal to stress infinite square root of pi a, that stress, that's that value here, I'm going to call the stress intensity factor. Why? Because you can see very clearly that this right here, this top term here, is acting as a multiplier to everything else. And it tells me how severe this stress is going to be. Um, yes, the crack tip is infinite, but in general, it tells you how strong is that stress concentration. It tells you a lot about the strength of that stress concentration. 
the greater the value of A, the higher the stress. The greater the remote stress sigma infinity, the higher the stress. So clearly, this K here, which I've called this, is giving me a lot of information about the stress intensity of that field. Now, theta, uh, you know, where we're interested in is theta equals zero initially, but you can look at other angles and figure out how that stress field is varying. But the highest stress will be right here at this point, and that corresponds to a theta of zero. So again, the crack size and the far field completely describe the severity of the stress state at the crack tip, and so we don't call that the stress intensity factor, this term right here. That's a very important point. So uh, the, in the airborne solution, we can observe in the solution that stresses at the tip of the crack are infinite independently of the load applied. So I didn't really resolve that problem of getting rid of that infinite stress of the crack tip. But what I was able to do is to understand what the stress is really doing near the crack tip. Since no material can withstand infinite stress, we should have failed the structure even at small cracks. And I see a lot of people taking models and finite element models and putting sharp crack tips and trying to predict stresses at the crack tip. Unfortunately, finite elements is based on the equilibrium, equilibrium equations of elasticity. And as a, as a consequence, if you use linear materials, doesn't matter how much you increase the mesh density, the more you increase the mesh density, the higher that stress is gonna be because you're gonna have a higher and higher stress as you approach the crack tip based on the elasticity theory. And so how do you predict failure? You're still in that conundrum of how you predict failure. So I wanna take you to Griffith in 1920s. That's where uh, we, we, we really wanna look at the work uh, that he did he extended English's 1913 work for an elliptical hole and developed a theoretical criterion of rupture, but based on the concepts of minimum potential energy and th thermodynamic principles. And he sought really to minimize the total energy of the system. That's really where he was coming from. Griffith was coming from the energy approach. And so Griffith extended that theorem of minimum, minimum total potential energy to account for the increase of surface energy, which occurs when you form cracks. And so because of this annoyance of the infinite stress, the energy-based approach was proposed, okay? And the energy required to propagate the crack by a length A. So if I want to increase uh, propagate the crack by length A, like shown here at the bottom, I have to break some atomic bonds, as you, you can see. But do you agree that by breaking these bonds, I create a new surfaces? And so let's call the energy to break those bonds gamma S, uh, the surface energy of these new surfaces. And there's a factor of two here because I have two surfaces, one at the top, one on the bottom. Let's call B the thickness, and A is a full crack that was propagated. Notice how A times B is a surface quantity, surface quantity, and gamma S is an energy count quantity per uh, unit length. And so this will give me energy. And so what we're really looking for here is a fundamental understanding of what is going on um, uh, with with the crack propagation here. So by propagating the crack, we created new surfaces, new, uh, and energy must have gone into that to, to make that happen. And so that's, that's where this is, Griffith is coming from, is to look at that, okay? So what is the key idea? Uh, Griffith fracture theory in 1921 also looked at that for unit crack extension to occur, under the influence of applied stress. So I have this applied stress, a little a crack there, that as the crack propagates a little bit more, a, a, any increase in, in, in crack extension causes a decrease in potential energy of the system. Um, and he found that the stored elastic energy, so there's a stored elastic energy here, and that must be equal 
to the increase in surface energy due to the crack extension. So, so in other words, there is an energy stored in the material. As the crack propagates a little bit of an amount, that stored energy gets released and that energy goes into increasing the surface energy due to the crack extension. So as an example, take, take a piece of paper at home. And no, another one that you want to recycle. And so you take that piece of paper, that paper has a stored energy. Put a little crack in there. As you apply loading, notice how the crack does not propagate in that paper. But when you, re you reach a critical value of loading that you apply to that paper, you will see the crack starts propagating. Well, the paper had some amount of stored energy, but what happened there is that when the crack propagated, the energy that was stored in the paper gets released and it goes into creating those surfaces. Another example could be a spring. Take a spring, but you know, a fairly weak spring so you can break it at home. So if you take a spring and that spring were to be loaded, I want you to notice that that spring will also have an elastic energy stored. And so as a consequence, what are we talking about there? If you apply a load to that piece uh, of, of, of a spring, that there will be a load at which the spring will break. When the spring breaks, you have released energy that was stored in the spring, and that energy went into breaking the spring. So the Westergaard solution, if I use the, the Westergaard solution, which is right here, if I use this, this, this Westergaard solution, this one right here, not the simplified version, but the full, full solution, and I were to calculate the total potential energy due to uh, the applied load, so there's a strain energy that's stored. So that's, that's this one right here, stress squared divided by two E prime V, and E prime here for plane stress is this, and for plane strain is this. But say for plane stress, you have sigma squared over two E times the volume of the material. Notice how there is a strain energy. So think about when you load up a sample uniaxially in the machine, in an instrument machine, you develop the stress strain curve. In the linear portion of the stress strain curve, the area under that curve is a triangle, if it's a linear behavior. So that's one half stress times strain. But strain is really stress divided by E. So therefore you get sigma squared divided by two E as a strain energy per unit density. And times the volume gives you total strain energy stored in the body of material. If you calculate the total potential energy due to the re remote stress applied, you and you use the Westergaard solution, uh, you will find that this is what you get as a second term. And, uh, and I invite you to download the paper and understand how this was derived. I'm not trying to go through every single derivation, but giving you the waypoints so you better understand uh, from the top level view how this was derived. Now here I showed you how I derived this expression right here, uh, one half e epsilon squared. This is also one half times stress times strain, and this is also equal to sigma squared divided by two e. So that's this term right here. The total energy due to breaking bonds then becomes the energy due to creation of new surface area times the crack length times b, and I have two surfaces uh, included, and then I have uh, you know. And then here we have applied half symmetry, so that's why you don't see the full 2A. And then here you have the strain energy, but the total strain energy. And then you have the total, the potential energy due to loads applied. And this is coming from taking the Westergaard solution and determining what is the potential energy due to the loads applied. And there has to be a point at which this energy is a minimum. And that's the minimum total potential energy theorem. That there is, 
a value of energy that attains a minimum when the system is actually in equilibrium. So we're trying to figure out when that happens. And as you can see here, the only thing that varies here is A. So if I take the derivative of E respect to A, perhaps I can find the crack length or A at which you have um, the minimum total potential energy. So uh, let me illustrate it uh, with a graph. So say you have this sample here and I have a loading applied to it. So I can increase the load and it's gonna track a load deflection. So you agree that you apply a load and you can uh, track the deflection. So that, that's what this is, load deflection. I increase the load, okay? And then when the crack grows, do you agree that when the crack grows, if I were to unload the sample and reload the sample, it will be less stiff? And that makes sense. That makes total sense that, that I have a lower compliance. Well, isn't the energy really the one below the curve? Well, this right here in shade is the energy released for the situation we have just discussed. So this shows the energy that was released due to crack growth. I'll take the derivative with respect to A of the energy and find what is the length A that causes unstable crack growth. And so, this uh, term right here has no A, and so the stored energy has no A, so then the derivative of E respect to A, the energy, uh, basically gives me this expression. I can solve for A, or I can solve for stress, and if I solve for stress, I find the critical stress, the fracture strength at which, for a particular crack length, I have failure, and gamma S, which is the energy that is required to create those new surfaces is also called the Griffith critical energy release rate. That's why G is being used because of Griffith. And this is a critical material parameter. E is a material parameter, it's the modulus of the material. A is half the crack length. And you can see here how this equation can be used to calculate the remote stress at which fracture occurs. Likewise, I can fix the value of stress and figure out what crack length will make this relationship equal. And that crack length, it will be the critical crack length at which cracking can occur. So again, we've, we've made a lot of progress here in, in, uh, from the energy standpoint. I started with mechanics to define what the stress intensity factor was. was and then we're looking at uh, the fact that the stress is infinite, and I'm still stuck with the issue that I don't know, I don't know what is the stress that causes failure. That's what took us to the energy approach. So if you recall, this is what I found for the stress field, but right at the crack tip is infinite. I found this idea of the stress concentration factor, stress intensity factor, which explains to me how intense the stress field is, which makes sense that it depends on A, and stress. But I was stuck there, so I have to go to Griffith to look at the energy standpoint, and notice how through the energy standpoint, I'm able to figure out the fracture strength now. I'm able to figure that out, given the modulus, given A, and given the critical energy release rate, which is a material parameter, I'm able to figure out the stress that's required, that remote stress that's required to fail the structure. So the good news is the critical stress intensity factor somehow, it is related to the critical energy release rate. We discussed previously that the stress intensity is the remote stress times the square root of pi a, but perhaps there is a critical value of stress intensity factor at which the structure fails. Call and that could correspond to a particular stress, which we could call the fracture strength. So assume there's a value of stress that causes fracture, we can call that the Kc, the stress, the critical stress intensity factor. So, so that's Kc, and then this Gc, the Griffith critical energy release rate, came from solving for Gc here. And so square both sides, 
put pi a to the other side, e becomes the denominator. And, and then, now I have these two expressions. I can divide the two expressions by sigma f. Um, and well, I can first square this formula. So square this formula, divide these two expressions, and then you get rid of the sigma f squared. The pi cancels out, and then you're left with this interesting relationship. And the relationship is very simple. That we've connected the idea that the critical energy release rate is connected to the stress intensity factor also, but the critical stress intensity factor squared divided by E. That's an immense finding because it shows us, it shows us that they're related by this modulus. And so I'm able to make this connection here from the energy side to the mechanic side. There's these three papers, again, I encourage you to find. Uh, so that you can go through that in great care. Let me show this from a different perspective really quick. I've kind of covered this, but I want to get back to the interpretation of G, the energy, the Griffith energy release rate due to the new surface area created. And so we're using the energy release rate. Why is it release rate? It's because I have a structure with a flaw and that gives me a compliance or a strain energy right or total potential energy and when the crack forms then you have a lower stiffness which means you have a lower amount of total pot potential energy so you have actually released some energy strain energy and that release of strain energy that caused the crack to propagate is equal to g and if G is greater than GC, which is a mature parameter, then crack growth occurs. So when does crack propagate? The idea is that the Griffith criterion for crack propagation can be written as follows. So G, if G is greater than GC, then crack propagates. Uh, the GC is a mature parameter. Um, in terms of the stress intensity factor, we can say the same thing. K1, the, the mold one stress intensity factor, if the stress intensity factor is greater or equal than K1C, then again, we have the situation where crack can occur. So this K1C, this value of critical stress intensity factor can be measured using ASTM standards. Here's the KC for various materials. You can see for glass, it's very small. And when you go to steels, it's fairly large. So there are three factors really driving the, 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 the likelihood of fracture, okay? You have the material toughness, fracture toughness, which is just K1C or GC, and that can vary depending upon what's going on in terms of the metallurgy, the temperatures, the environments. You also have the crack size, so the crack size drives also when cracking can occur. And then you have the stress level. So if you have a very low stress level, then, G or K will be relatively small. As an example, take the situation that we were studying. The situation that we're studying is this flaw in a remote, uh, with a remote stress applied. So the question becomes when the structure fell. So I know that K1C can be measured, the KC, the stress intensity factor. If this stress is very low, then and A is very small, then perhaps this is less than K, KC and it's not going to propagate any flaw. But if stress for a particular value of A increases to a point where this value of K becomes equal to KC, then the crack will propagate. For a particular value of stress, there is a critical value of A for which K will become equal to KC. So the crack length will, can be critical as well, and you can figure that out. So there's two ways to get that stress high, the stress intensity factor high enough to make it, to make the crack propagate. And so that's, that, that's really what we're discussing here. Uh, three factors here influence the, the, uh, the ability of the structure to fail under loading conditions, crack size, and temperature conditions. So again, more references, Free to download, study these materials. Feel free to pause the video at this point.
go and, and, and download this from the library and study them so you can have uh, an understanding of, of what the four, that the fathers of this area were thinking about when they're deriving this equation. The other point I want to make is that it was discovered that the Griffith criterion underestimated the critical failure strength of many materials. So it was uh, too conservative. In metallic materials, there is this idea that when you apply loading and you have a ductile type material, that there's some energy that also goes into uh, the plastic deformation near the crack tip. Recall how the stress can go to infinite near the crack tip. When you consider plastic deformation, you're looking at some significant amount of plasticity near the crack tip for a particular value of stress. And so it's very important to understand that that should be considered in, in the evaluation. And so how that was done was by adding to G1, GC, the, 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 basically the Total critical energy release rate now depends on the energy that, that goes into forming new surfaces, GC, plus the plastic energy that's consumed by the plastic deformation near the crack tip. And so it was found that by adding this, it increased the, the, the failure strength of a lot of metals. So by adding this, by not adding this term, you're being too conservative. By adding this term, uh, you have uh, been able to account for plasticity. Now you have to do certain tests, and I'll discuss one of those tests, to be able to find this total value. I want to continue discussing, I want to continue the discussion with plastic zone size. So why we not substitute the expressions for crack field tip? So we found this expression. Uh, and then I didn't discuss this one, but uh, for plain strain, you can look at the stress in the direction outside of the plane, so in the third direction, outside of the plane of the page, and the Poisson ratio gets involved. So this is a very simple calculation to find that um, if you add this two times nu, gives you that. So that's what there's coming from. If you add this plus that, sigma one plus sigma two times nu, gives you this expression. This comes from the Poisson ratio. If you apply, you know, if you have a stress field, sigma one and sigma two, then for plane strain conditions, sigma three will be equal to sigma one plus sigma two times nu. Uh, for plane stress, the structure can be so thin that you don't develop a stress in the, through a the thickness or out of plane direction. Um, but if you substitute these far, these cracked fields uh, to figure out the plastic zone size, we're interested in that, uh, and that'll become important for a reason coming up. But if I were to take the stress fields and put them into this von Mises stress, uh, von Mises stress criterion states that if this is equal to this, then yielding occurs. So it's a yield surface. So I can plug this in here and determine from there what, what is a plastic zone size for my situation. And so uh, the idea there then is to study, um, to, to, feel, to, to substitute this here and then find R. Okay, so uh, for when we do that for plane strain, uh, we get this expression, we can solve for, for the plastic zone size. And then for plane stress, again, we can solve it for R again and then find the plastic zone size. So you can see here plastic strain and plex, plex, uh, plane strain and plane stress will give you different plastic zone size uh, because uh, the behavior is different at the crack tip, as shown by this. The stress field looks different in the third direction. And so you can see here that for very thin, this is the plastic zone size, so that's for plane stress. And as you go thicker, the plastic zone size very significantly smaller in the interior. You can see that because the stress field is not as constrained. Uh, and so, um, if we want to determine the plastic zone size as twice R Y, uh, then this will be the expression uh, right at the crack tip, and then. Uh, for thicker uh, plane strain uh, condition, this will be your plastic zone size. And you see smaller uh, than this one. And it's three times smaller because, uh, again, there's no constraint. Uh, it's constraint. So uh, let's look here at what is going on uh, in the thread thickness direction. Okay. Uh, 
So that's why this is coming from here, this sigma, this stress in the third direction. The plane stress, you have a very thin structure. So the stress that develops in this direction is fairly small. And so that's why you develop a larger plastic zone. And then for thicker sample, it's behaving more like plane strain. And again, what we're discussing there is that uh, the, the plastic zone size is smaller and by a third almost. So I also want to point out for linear elastic material, the yield uh, point, uh, ROI, is going to be this much. Uh, I do want to point out that the plastic zone can, uh, can extend that even more. But just want to make that common. That's why there's a two times ROI. It, ex it can extend more, uh, but for linear elastic, then the plastic zone, zone can be considered up to this point. The reason that it can extend more, because from linear elasticity, the plastic zone will be some amount, uh, but if the yield stress cuts that off, all that energy has to go somewhere. So, so therefore, you're gonna have, for an elastic plastic material, uh, you're gonna have, it, that stress is gonna have, to, this, all this stress will have to get redistributed beyond that plastic zone to this point. So plastic zone can be even larger. So when can you really apply linear elastic fracture mechanics? That's the key here because recall linear elastic fracture mechanics start, you know, we, we started that discussion with uh, some mechanics that, that did not consider plasticity. So uh, when can you use it? Due to the plastic zone and the crack tip, can you really use this? The answer is yes, you can use it because the plastic zone can be fairly localized. The question is when is good enough? When, when is the plastic zone too large where I can no longer trust the results for the stress intensity factor calculation? And the answer is that we can use linear elastic pressure mechanics in the situations where we have small scale yielding. And that means that, uh, uh, that the crack tip, that the plastic zone size is relatively small relative to the crack length, as well as the geometric dimensions of the specimens of the part. So what are the restrictions for LEFEM? They are recommended. So we want to make sure that the net stress in the crack plane be less than 0.8 times the yield stress. So that means that if I look at the net section without the crack tip, so I look at the net section, that the stress there is 0.8 times sigma, sigma yield. Under monotonic loading, we're looking at the, the plastic, the radius, Ry, the Ry, to be less than the thickness divided by eight, also the crack length divided by eight, and also we wanna make sure the remaining ligament divided by eight, that Ry is less than the remaining ligament uh, minus a divided by eight. Uh, and uh, again, that's the uncracked ligament. So if the width, the sample is width, crack length is A, then the remaining uncracked ligament is W minus A. Make sure that's RY is less than that divided by eight. If those three conditions apply, then linear elastic fracture mechanics becomes very attractive. So um, let's talk about the situations where you know, we want to account for the small scale yielding. We want to take account for that plastic zone. So Erwin had this correction factor that he thought of. And the idea was to increase, to basically add this Ry to A, just add it up. And if I do that, and notice uh, that this is uh, twice Ry, so Ry, this is Rp basically. But if I want to look at twice Ry, Ry is really half of this. And so if I look at the, a plane stress one, the idea is to add that one to A, the crack length, and I get an effective A, and use that effective A, so I've increased the crack length effectively, and so as a consequence, now that goes into my stress intensity factor calculation. The problem is that the stress intensity factor calculation, um, which is this one, which depends on geometry, stress, and the crack length, the effective crack length has increased but that includes the Ry, which also has a K. So K shows up here and here, and so this has to be solved iteratively. Uh, and, and the way people do that is 
basically just solving this numerically or iteratively. You can substitute the value of a that you started with, get a new k, put the k in here, get a r, take r, add it to a, and then keep doing this calculation until the, the, the two sides are fairly equal. So this is how you account for the plastic zone size using the, the Irwin's correction factor, uh, and that's really, really good for small scale yielding. So that's where the limitations are. Um, I'm sure that you all understand uh, really what we're talking about here, okay? Um, so let's now discuss uh, the stress intensity factor solutions. Um, so the stress intensity factor solutions, the, the, the solution I dis discussed earlier was a, a plate with a crack subjected to a remote stress. And, but for a more general situation, um, the, for the most general situation, the stress intensity factor depends on a geometric factor, a crack length, and the remote stress. So it's very important to understand that the one I discussed earlier, F was equal to one. And that was the simplest solution that we found. But the solution becomes more complex for various situations. And, and, and so I'll be discussing that. Um, and note how F depends on the geometry. And when this value of K reaches K, C is when the crap propagates. So there is a handbooks. There's many handbooks that have the stress intensity factors. I recommend that you download them or buy them. Uh, but here's a, feel free to pause the video, find this, uh, these books, get them to the library. And even this website could be very handy. It has some solutions as well. Uh, but I recommend that, that you download them. I'll go through some solutions um, uh, and, and we could even discuss it more uh, as we go through. Um, but uh, these handbooks tend to be in the hundreds of pages and tend to be very useful for, for industry. Uh, or many different applications uh, that you may encounter. If we have a situation of a crack with an edge crack with a remote stress, you can see here that the stress intensity factor, and there's this uh, I here means one, mode one, and it's mode one because the crack is opening, and I'll discuss that a little bit later, but for now, this stress intensity factor uh, is 1.12 times the stress, remote stress, times the square root of pi times a, and a is this distance. Note how this equation looks quite different from the same situation but the crack in the center. And remember that with the crack in the center, the crack length was 2a. Here the crack at the edge is a. Just want to point out that difference because it does make a difference in terms of trying to compare this one to the other one. This situation is more damaging and the reason is because there is no restraint that this this is a free edge and the crack can open more freely compared to the centered crack where the crack was restrained by the material surrounding it okay so that's 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 an analytical solution uh, and you can use these analytical solutions ver for various situations that you may encounter um if you have the situation uh of a circular flaw, and the circular flaw was embedded in a solid piece of material, then the, the solution is actually 2 over pi sigma square root of pi a. And note how this pi is 3.14. So 2 over 3.14 gives me a value that's closer to 0.7. So this value here, this stress intensity factor for an elliptical configuration, this gives me a stress intensity factor lower then the stress intensity factor for a crack that goes through for a remote stress, because the formula for that was k equals sigma square root of pi a. So this is 30% lower and makes sense because this, the crack tip now, which is surrounding this right here, the, there's solid material surrounding the whole thing. That's not a situation for fully, for a through crack, right? Uh, so it makes sense that the stress intensity factor for this situation is more benign. Um, if we look at 
uh, a situation like this. Given this situation with the crack oriented like that, with a stress field applied like that, you can use more circle and transform the stress field. And what you will get is uh, a shear and tension loading. And the mode one part is going to be the stress here in this scenario, cosine squared beta squared to pi a. So that's your uh, solution for mode one. Uh, note that at beta equals zero, you recover the solution we have previously gotten. Okay. Um, and so uh, just want to point out uh, if I, we put beta equals zero, we recover the solution we got before, which is stress times square root of pi a. And then here we get uh, this one here, which is new to this mode two. That means the crack, the crack surface is sliding past each other due to shear. So the top surface slides relative to the bottom one due to shear loading. And so beta of zero gives you k2 of zero. Uh, and then if beta is a different angle, like 45, you get one half, one half here and you have a mode two component. So uh, note how the stress intensity factor uh, can, you can actually solve cracks at different incline, uh, a crack at an incline relative to the remote stress. So we continue now with other types of solutions which are worth looking at. So here is an example of the, um, elliptical crack now. This was a circular crack, but now we're looking at the elliptical crack. For the elliptical crack configuration, um, you could have a flaw that's 2a and 2c, and is infinite uh, in size, and you have a remote stress. And you can see here how uh, the formulas look quite different now. So uh, uh, you basically have this function here, f of phi has to be calculated using this formula. Uh, and phi, notice how f phi varies. And so, um, so for varying phi, uh, it, will, it will get you across this semicircle here, um, and you, a semi-elliptical uh, crack uh, interface or phase. And for phi of zero, you're talking about this point here, so that, that's one and that's zero. And then A over C of one will give you the F phi of one. And then A over C of one gives you 2.464, which goes into the denominator. Um, and so anyway, so these are the calculations and you can recover back this solution. Um, we can then go to the surface crack. This was a very interesting one because it occurs quite a bit. The surface crack, uh, but again, with a, is embedded in an infinite medium. Um, and again, now this is a little more complicated. You have a lambda s, which corrects it. So it corrects this further, um, but it keeps all the other stuff the same. It just has this extra correction. And uh, again, A over C now is defined this way. And as a crack could propagate deeper, if this was finite width, it could then propagate through. And so it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, so that's how this works. That's the stress intensity factor solutions. Um, and we can go to more complicated solutions, like the finite width edge stress intensity factor solution. Uh, if you have a finite width, then if you have a flaw, um, you can see here, if there's an infinite medium at two W, the stress field can still go around the hole. But when you cut off the edge like that, then all that stress has to get concentrated here. So these are, the finite width edge actually has to have some sort of modifier because of that finite width compared to the infinite solution where it was just simply sigma squared of pi a. Now you have to correct it for that finite width and that's where this part comes in. There's a second alternate solution people have used here is the bottom, at the bottom is provided. Um, w is a width, half of the width. A, again, is half of the crack size in this case. Uh, again, you have to pay attention to what A and 2C mean because here A is a full crack length in the depth direction and 2C is a full width. Uh, you have to, again, pay attention here. That's 2A and 2C. So pay attention to the crack length because you can get it off by a factor of two, uh, which can cause a lot of problems when you're actually trying to apply for real applications. Um, 
there's also additional solutions, and these are actually testing that people do to determine K1. So there, there are various ways of calculating K1. The way you will do this, you set up this in the, in the instrument machine, apply a load P, and then as you apply the load P, the sample will break at a particular value of P. Well, the good news is there is a way to calculate K1C out of those tests. So I invite you to download the STM standards. I'll go through one of them. But here's a close form, close form solutions for some of these test specimens. Here's a single edge notch tension, which is very similar to this situation. The free, sorry, I, didn't sh I showed you the free edge crack, so it will be similar to that. Then you have the single edge notch bend, which is a three point bend test. And when you apply the loading, it will open up the crack. And you have the center crack tension, which looks like this. Um, and I, keep, I can keep going on. You have the compact ten specimen test um, that looks like this. Uh, and these are standard specimens for which you can calculate K1C. Basically, apply a load P, figure when the crack propagates. When the crack propagates for value of P, you got K1C. That's how this works. Um, there's good correlation against test data. Like if you were to take um, the center crack panel, testing with a finite width, and I were to do the corrections as, show, as shown earlier, you can show that the calculation with this formula fairly matches experiments. And so it's important to understand that. The, the stress to failure is on the y-axis, the crack length is given here, half the crack length. And you can see it does fairly well against experiments. And so you can see that these solutions do work very well once you find K1C. Um, there's other types of uh, solutions that get even more complex. So say you have this edge crack solution. Um, so you have a finite width. You have the edge crack. And I have a moment and applied load, P. Well, you can superimpose the load P and the moment solutions and find uh, this total combination. So there is a solution for the actual load applied. If there's a solution for the moment applied, and then add the two and then get the combination, the superposition. And so stress intensity factor solutions can be superimposed to get various uh, stress intensity factors for more complex loading conditions. Here's another one that's interesting. You have a crack in that looks like a crack that looks like this from a say an aircraft design panel. And so at the rivet holes, perhaps cracks were developed. Uh, where the skin attaches to the framework stringer. Um, and so it's potential that you want to analyze the situation of a loading acting surrounding this crack. Um, so here, what you could do is you can analyze the situation of the uniform tension solution, which looks like this, and then analyze a solution of a concentrated force. Um, and if you do that, and this solution exists, so if you analyze this, then you can add these two solutions to get the combined effect of the load P coming from these other rivets surrounding it, um, and then the, the remote stress uh, sigma. So that will give me the combined stress. Uh, you also have a small edge crack uh, solution. In this case, this edge crack is over here, uh, over here, and that's the solution that you get. This is your stress intensity factor. Uh, for that situation, uh, for a crack, a small edge crack. Um, and that's not very different from this solution. Uh, so that's uh, essentially the same solution. Uh, you can see that here, tangent, secant, so all that is there. Um, the Roger Newman equations are very important. Uh, in fact, uh, here in this link, you can download the paper Raj is very well known. Uh, he's uh, one of the greatest scientists I've met. Uh, he has worked extensively. The area of fracture mechanics uh, is, is, um, is an important figure in the area of fracture mechanics. Now, if you talk to him, he's, gonna, he's going to you know, uh, decrease his importance. But the reality is that the contributions of, of what he's done has been impactful in the area of fracture mechanics. So I invite you to download this paper, go through this very carefully, and kind of learn about uh, the, the, how he developed the solutions. I think you will learn a lot from it. And I believe that he will tell you that all he did was curve fitting. 
but no, he did a lot more than curve fitting, uh, and and it's been used now extensively in almost every application: composite overwrap pressure vessels, pressure vessels, and and so forth. So as I discussed earlier, I didn't want to get into this yet, but oh, back earlier, but there are three modes of fracture. Uh, there is the mode one fracture, which I discussed extensively. You can derive the mode two solution, which is sliding. The top surface slides against the bottom surface. And then you have the tear part. So this is tearing. The top surface is uh, uh, basically uh, sliding versus the bottom surface. And so you have some sliding there that's occurring. And so that's your mode three. Um, and so it's interesting to find that the mode one, mode two, mode three stress intensity factors can be calculated. And in this, in this form here, if you put it in this form, uh, you can relate K1, K2, and K3 to G. Uh, and so you can use the energy release rate as a total value and then calculate when fracture could occur. So this one approach of relating K1, K2, and K3 to the energy side when you have multi -mo multiple modes of fracture. So where, where are we in the, the, the big picture? So remember uh, about an hour ago or more, we discussed the stress intensity factor. That was the goal, to discuss this and this loading condition stress. That's what we're discussing. Um, and, and I wanna point out that, that again, the stress intensity factor depends on the stress, the flaw size, and if the crap propagates, this K1 value has to be greater than K1C, which is a material property. So I discussed this left-hand side quite a bit, I haven't discussed K1C yet, which is the material property. So let's discuss that next. Um, and so again, uh, what is fracture toughness? It's a mechanical property that measures the material's resistance to fracture. This parameter characterizes the intensity of the stress field in the material local to the crack tip when rapid crack extension takes place. Uh, similar to other microstructural behaviors, the fracture toughness can vary significantly as a function of temperature and strain rate. So unlike the yield strength, Kc, uh, the Kc is strongly dependent upon the crack tip constraint due to the thickness. Uh, and the reason is that the thickness has to be considered as part of the fracture analysis, which I showed you earlier. And this, is, this has to do with the crack tip plastic deformation. I showed you how the crack tip deformation the crack, crack the plastic deformation greatly changes depending upon the, uh, the thickness of the sample. And so very similarly, KC gets uh, affected. So it's important that whatever KC we're using is really applicable uh, or has a correction for the thicknesses that you're trying to apply it to. Uh, here's a, a laundry list of ASTM standards that can be used to characterize K1C uh, you can characterize the fatigue crack growth. Uh, I'll cover that later, uh, and, and so forth. You can see here, uh, E1820 will allow you to characterize fracture toughness using the J1C. Again, feel free to pause the video and download all these standards. Do it now, because later you will not do that. And so it's important to download them, kind of go through them, understand them. Uh, some of these tests uh, involve the Sharpie test, uh, you have all kinds of tests in here, the creep, crack, growth rates, uh, and so forth. So, so I, I invite you to download it. E399 is the one that we'll talk a little bit more. Uh, the E399, uh, you have the plain strain fracture toughness K1C, the crack extension resistance. It measures the cracks. It basically measures the crack extension resistance under conditions of crack tip plain strain in mode one for slower rates of loading under under linear elastic conditions and very small plastic zones. And so you will see there that you have to look at the onset behavior 2% or less, uh, download that uh, ASTM standard and go through that. You can also look at uh, E1820, which is this one right here, uh, and that one allows you to measure J1C, which is really meant for the crack extension resistance uh, when plastic deformation is involved. So, so here are the two uh, important parameters that should be considered. On this bottom one, I had talked about earlier that if you have significant amount of plastic deformation, then linear elastic fracture mechanics cannot be really used. 
And so that's where this idea of the J integral becomes important and the measurement of J1C becomes important. Uh, for small amount of plastic zone compared to the crack length, K1C is important, uh, is what you will be using, linear elastic fracture mechanics. And you can apply the idea as a small scale yielding using the Irwin's correction factor where you took the plastic zone radius and added that to the crack length to correct for it. So again, two different me metrics, one for linear elastic and then the other one for plastic deformation. Now you can use J, J simplifies to K when there's no plastic deformation. So again, J to K can be related through uh, this relationship here at the bottom or the one I had shown much earlier. So uh, going to the next slide here, uh, we could talk about an, an example of sizing the sample using the STM standard. Uh, I point this out. So say you have the low strength steel and the fracture toughness and you have the modulus. So the idea is what are the minimum specimen size requirements for a valid K1C? And so um, you will calculate, you, you have these two parameters, so you plug it in and the STM standard wants, wants you to make sure that these parameters are greater than this. And so that, that's to ensure that the plastic zone is, is sized properly. So this is one of the checks you have to do to size the sample to get the right parameters to get K1C correctly. There's additional ASTM standards for composites. This particular lecture is not getting into the composites aspects, although I did discuss this in the bonded joints uh, section. Um, but if you do encounter composites, you can calculate the Griffith critical energy release rate for mold one of our composite with the ASTM standard D5528 and then the mixed mold bending condition ASTM standard D6671. So when does failure occur? Failure uh, occurs when K1 equals K1C, but I wanna bring something to our attention. Uh, the failure stress at which failure occurs can be solved here. Assume Y is one for a, sec for, for a second. So st stress, a failure can be solved there, right? For small cracks, failure will be yield and not fracture. That's important to understand. For sort of small cracks, the failure will be driven by yielding, not fracture. So both needs to be checked. That's important. Uh, here, what we've done, we, if we solve for C, then C my yield becomes a limiting factor and I can look at the value of C. So I can compare the value of C to the value of C here. And the idea there is, that if the cracks that I have are less than the critical value of C based on this form, that then yielding will occur. And if the cracks are greater than this critical value of C, then fracture is more likely to occur. So the transition from failure to fracture due to yield occurs right at C critical. So this is very important to calculate. And you can see here again that uh, for small values of the flaw size, and below this critical value, then yielding is a dominant strength failure mechanism. And then when critical values, the flaw is greater than the critical flaw size, then fracture is dominating, is dominated by this formula here. So the big picture again, I discuss how to calculate stress intensity factor, and that's based on handbook solutions like Roger and Newman, the loading stress as applied, the K1C, is a material parameter that's important to then determine whether K1 uh, is equal to K1C and whatnot. But then there's this value C, and this value C needs to be discussed because how you select the value in a design, uh, that's where we wanna, we wanna bring the idea of the non-destructive evaluation. So structures may contain flaws we may, which may not be detected by inspection techniques. So non-destructive evaluation techniques are such techniques uh, damage tolerance assumes that flaws exist, so you have to ensure the flaw will not grow to critical value during operation. You want to make sure the flaw will not propagate to catastrophic failure during operation. So you're, if you don't see a flaw, then how do you know whether there's a flaw? So the, the, the idea of damage tolerance is to assume there's one below the ND uh, inspection limit. And so when the, a known flaw is found, then you assume that. And and a lot of studies have been done on how to select the C if you don't see a flaw. If you see a flaw, that's easy. You plug it in here and then they get the value of K1 knowing the stress. And if K1 is less than K1C, you're fine. If the value of K1 is greater than K1C, you have to pay attention because unstable crack growth can occur. 
And so from that perspective, it's important to understand that if I don't see a flaw, maybe just assume a value of C and that a value of C can be based upon the ND detection limits. And so that's what, our, what we're talking about here. And so NASA 5009 is an, exa is an area where you could go for to give you guidance as to what ND sizes to select. So that's the non-destructive evaluation requirements for fracture critical metallic components document. And this document will contain various flaw configurations, part thicknesses, and the crack types that you need to consider for that particular ND technique. And so these are the initial flaw sizes A and C that you can use because these are, these are your, uh, basically your minimum detectable flaw sizes based on the standard methods. And how was this developed was basically looking for, um, you know, high confidence in the ability to detect flaws. So they had to put flaws in a lot of samples and basically see if the ND technique can find them. And so you want to really find them with 90% probability, with 95% confidence, 90, 95. And so uh, in, in table two here, that's in SI units. In table one, you have it in inches. But again, uh, I invite you to download that standard. You can download it very well and kind of go through that document uh, to really understand it. Now, this is approved for public release, so nothing to worry about there. So go ahead and study that. I think you'll learn a lot. Here's uh, some of the geometries here in the first column as shown here too, for, for, so you can then relate the different flaw, uh, flaw configurations into the first table. You can connect the two. And so uh, here is a through crack, a corner crack, and so forth. So I invite you to go through those examples uh, and, and figure that out. Uh, example number one, uh, we have an example. So say you have an, a situation where uh, you have a, a brittle gra glass, and uh, the question is, what is the remote stress at which failure is to occur if a 25.4 millimeter crack is present? So you have a modulus of 70,000, you have a critical energy release rate of seven joules per meter squared. You can use the Griffith criterion and plug in values. I have the values for all of that, so I'll just plug it in. Just make sure you have consistent units and then you're able to find the failure stress at which cracking can occur. Notice how I needed the energy criterion to make this happen. Otherwise, the stress is infinite in the crack tip. I can't do much with that. Uh, no, this failure load is very small. Uh, the failure strength, for example, for or yield strength of our aircraft grade material is 400 megapascals. So this is significant, significantly smaller uh, uh, than that. Uh, example two is. Say you have a thin plate of material that contains a center flaw of this length and is subject to this amount of stress. Uh, and then you have a material uh, that has a yield of 1400 megapascal. So we need to calculate the plastic zone size and calculate the stress intensity factor. So uh, we just simply use the formula. We know A, we know stress, so calculate K. So very simple calculation. Uh, the plastic zones radius can be calculated with the formula we discussed before. Uh, K is known, sigma Y was given the yield stress, and then calculate the radius, which gives you this much. Now, this is fairly small. The question is this small compared to the crack length, and, uh, and, and I suggest it is. Um, this is 0 0.008, and this is way smaller than that. Uh, so we can use the Irwin's plastic correction factor and see how much the K changes. Uh, and we can either iterate and figure how much that is. I can add eight to the 2.5 and I, and I calculate, I get 56.35, which is very close to 55. So I could then take 56, plug it back in here, calculate R and add it back to A and then figure a new K. But since these two are so close, we're probably fine. So, you know, LEFM is valid here. K did not change very much. Uh, here, I have a heat treated material now. So the flow stress dropped to 385. Uh, so if I drop it to 385, the radius increases to 3.31. And when I add it to the crack length, K changed quite a bit. Now I've, I've used the Erwin's correction factor here. And so the stress intensity factor has increased and that's quite significant. So the correction is fairly large. It makes you believe that the LFEM usage is dubious. However, we've corrected it using the Irwin's correction 
so perhaps we want to make sure that it's at least small scale yielding and not extensive yielding. So I invite you to go back and look at the early FM criteria um, uh, for that. Um, so uh, keep that in mind um, as you go through this. Um, and so what you really want to do is compare this uh, to K1C if, and, and see if failure will occur. Uh, again, you know, that's how you deal with these situations. You will try, you, you'll be given a fracture toughness and then you want to see if the, the, you could have crap propagation. So, so this is how that will work. Uh, say you have another example here where you have a circular hole with a flaw here. Again, you can calculate plastic zone radius given the information on the remote stress, given the thickness, given this information. Uh, you can calculate plastic zone, you get this much. Uh, R over is fairly small. You can correct the, 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 the crack length by adding the plastic correction. And so you add A to that. And so then you can, and then the function F is given in handbooks for this particular geometry. So you can cal calculate K1 and K1 comes to 40. And then you can basically, uh, determine, uh, equate this to that to figure out how much stress is, which will cause it to fail because A and R are known. And the question here is, what is the remote stress that caused failure? So uh, ca calculate it by solving for stress. And when you do that, uh, you're fairly, uh, that will be the stress at which they will, this will break. So this is how this one works. Fairly simple calculation. Again, uh, the, this question was, uh, you know, what is the remote stress for this information? So again, the geometry is given, go to a handbook, use it, and then correct, correct it for Irwin's plastic correction using this formula, and then calculate K1C. So, so that's what we're after here, uh, and we've been able to do that fairly successfully, okay? Um, and so I'll continue here, numerical techniques, um, and in, numer in the numerical techniques, uh, um, uh, so let's go back and discuss. Um, let me connect. Let me connect the dots for you back here um, to make sure we understand each other. So if you find a flaw, then this value C is known. The remote stress is known. You can calculate K1, uh, and then you can compare K1 to K1C. K1C is found through testing. Uh, and um, and so um, so let's continue with uh, numerical uh, techniques to to find this G uh, this critical this energy release rate. Uh, there are four ways to do this. The first one is the finite difference approach using the potential energy. The next one is the compliance method. The next one is the virtual crack closure technique which uh, if you look down in the link to this video description, you're gonna see another link that shows you how to get this. Uh, so Abacus tutorial. And then you have the J integral, which you're gonna see later on, I'm gonna invite uh, Lifu uh, Wang to go through that, how to do the J integral. Uh, all those four will be, uh, give you the same answer if you did it correctly. You can also simulate crack growth using the virtual crack closure technique. Uh, and there's other ideas like XFDM and things like that. So these are more advanced methods. And then you have the cohesive element approach, which uh, I will also discuss today. Uh, this one, we, we're not going to go through. Um, um, this one, we're not going to go through um, in great detail today. Uh, but we'll have the tutorial for this one. And then we're going to look at a tutorial for this one and the first one. And the last, the, this middle one here, there's already a tutorial if you look down uh, in the description. Uh, so let's go through the numerical techniques. Uh, what is going on here? So the calculation of G using method one is basically, here's a crack tip, and here's your finite element of mesh. Uh, the strain energy on their applied loads is basically one half the deflections of every point, so the deflection vector of all the points times the stiffness times the deflections minus the deflections times the force applied. So then the energy release rate um, uh, becomes, so you take the derivative of u respect to a, so the derivative of u respect to the crack length. Um, and what you'll find is that 
uh, you get this expression right here. So you're going to get the derivative of k respect to a, okay? Uh, because you're going to have the derivative of q respect to a. Uh, and when you do that, you're going to have kq minus f. And then here you're going to have q, derivative of f respect to a, but this is zero for a constant applied force. And so then you're left with this expression here. And so what you're really doing then is you have to calculate all the deflections that you have in the system. And then you take the change in stiffness. So this stiffness matrix is a number of degrees of freedom you have across the system uh, divided by, by the crack extension, the crack area. Um, this is a crack extension really. So if this was an initial crack, you know, that's your extension delta A. The depth of this page is B, so thickness B times delta A is delta A there. Um, and so G becomes this calculation. So you can do that with finite elements very simply. Um, and, and all you have to do is really calculate, uh, keep the same number of elements and the same number of nodes, just shift the node. You can just shift that node a little bit back. Uh, to represent new crack length. And then you can just use this calculation very simply. Um, that's one approach. Method number two is really looking at the very definition of energy release rate. You have the strain energy that's stored uh, due to a crack length A. You extend that crack length a little bit and the strain energy changes. And it changes because there's energy, energy released due to the crack extension since that energy went into creating new surfaces. So then you divide that by the uh, change in crack length uh, or area, and this ratio gives you the energy release rate or the energy that was released to create the new, the extension of that crack. So that is one method, and I'm gonna discuss that method on how to apply that in, in, in Abacus. So Abacus has the ability to calculate, so you basically create your mesh, this is your mesh, you apply the loads here at this point and this point, and then uh, you can create three models, A0, A1, with different crack lengths. So these are crack length, uh, make a crack length A0, A1, A2, and so forth. But make A0, A1, and A2 is fairly small relative to each other. So the A0, A1, and A2 are, are very close in value, right? So you're gonna keep those very close. And so once you do that, you can, Abacus will actually give you the value of U. And that's A-L-L-I-E. It can give you that as an output for the whole model. So you plot U for the total model for each of these crack lengths. And then this slope here, this slope here really gives you this value of G. Okay, this is how you do it, okay? Um, and method three uh, looks at compliance. Uh, it's fairly similar to this method, uh, not very different. Uh, but in this method, um, you're looking at uh, the compliance. So compliance is delta divided by P. Uh, you have a load applied P, you can measure delta, the deflection. And uh, to keep that in mind, uh, that's your compliance it depends on the crack length because the longer the crack length, the longer the crack length, the easier to pull that up. And so the compliance does change very simply. Um, so you wanna do that for three crack lengths. And so that's your compliance, that's your crack length, the crack length, and you calculate that compliance. Once you have the compliance, uh, you can then calculate G by using this formula. So you have this slope, you have this slope here for the same load P. You're doing this for the constant load P. For constant load P, you calculate delta. Now for a longer crack and constant load P, you expect, expect more deflection. So that's the compliance is increasing with crack length. That makes total sense. That slope, this slope right here, is the one you're gonna use in this calculation with the constant load P and the thickness uh, B of that plate. And that'll give you G. That's method three, and it works really well. And what I like about these two methods, they're closely aligned with test standards. You can actually model the test standards and um, you can actually get uh, moving. And so, there's another method. The fourth method is called the J integral method. And the idea is that you're uh, basically taking a, uh, uh, the integral, 
uh, or a path independent counter integral around the crack tip. And so uh, that calculation involves, you have the strain energy, which obviously stored around this body of material, this little piece, I'm doing, I'm doing an integral around this volume. And then stress sigma j and j corresponds to the phases here where cracking has occurred. Um, and so uh, th that's another approach that you could calculate the energy release rate. We're gonna show you that as a demonstration, as part of the finite element demonstration uh, later today in the video. Um, and uh, you, you, can, you can also use post-processing software to do, it, to do this calculation uh, by uh, writing it out in this manner. So what, all I've done is expanded this in this manner. And what I wanna point out is that these calculations can be done simply by calculating the deformation gradient. You can see here it, it requires the gradient of the deformation, the stresses, and then integrate that over that volume of material. Now you can select as big of a contour, or smallest contour as you want, um, but the important thing is that because it's a, a path independent contour, you can make the contour any, any way you want and you should be able to find the correct energy release rate, which is quite amazing. We're gonna show an example of that a little bit later. Um, and so, um, uh, you, this is a crack plane, and then in uh, in Abacus or whatever software you, you may use, um, you, you have to tell the software in which direction you're trying to calculate the energy release rate. So if the crack wants to propagate in this direction, then you will tell it to, to calculate uh, based on counter integrals, and you're gonna look at multiple rings to figure out, uh, am I getting to a converged solution for J or the, J or the energy release rate? So again, um, you wanna check multiple rings around the crack tip. And the reason in finite elements you have to do that is because, uh, uh, because it's, you have discretized the domain, you wanna make sure that anytime you discretize the domain, you have to do a convergence study. So don't do just one ring, do multiple rings until you feel confident that you've gotten there, okay? So we continue here. Um, here's how you will do it in Abacus. Feel free to pause the video, take a screenshot, uh, but it, it shows you uh, kind of the steps within Amicus, and we're gonna try to do that later in the video. Uh, important thing to note that energy, energy release rate is energy per area, uh, so just make sure you have the units uh, clear to you, um, and uh, you will see later how we can accomplish this. There's also uh, a, a method five to this calculation. Um, method five is looking at um, basically um, the finite crack extension technique. Uh, this method requires two finite element analyses, the change in strain energy is calculated in this manner, and then the change in flow size is calculated in this manner. Uh, but this, this is the original idea, and then it evolved to the virtual crack closure technique uh, which allows you to do it just in one FEA analysis. It does not require uh, specialized elements uh, like you're gonna see later in the video. You can simply do VCCT, virtual crack closure technique without having to extend that crack size. And so the idea is that it allows a direct calculation of the strain, en strain energy release rates for each mode in this manner um, for each node along the crack front. So the VCCT uses the forces right at the crack front and then the opening deflections immediately behind the crack, crack front. Uh, so these, these, uh, these opening deflections are used. So you have the forces right here and the opening deflections right here. And then you can uh, basically determine G1, G2, and G3. And the addition of all of this gives you the G that we talked about earlier. Again, U3 and U3 here are uh, the deflections uh, opening the flaw, U1, U2, and U2, U2 here. These are the sliding deflections uh, in the U2 direction and U1 direction. So the top phase slides relative to the bottom phase. That's what these two calculations are doing. It's the sliding of the top first surface relative to the bottom surface. While U3 here is the relative opening deflections in the three directions. So that's what this one is here. 
And these forces that go here are the forces you can measure right here at the crack tip. So that calculation works really well. Uh, and that's a VCCT method that if you look at the description below, there's a link applied. Here, you see a reference to Kruger, a colleague, you know, he's, he's great, he's well known in the area. You can find this document and kind of give it a good read to understand the, me the method uh, much better. So uh, let's apply this to a simple quick example. Determine the fracture toughness, K1, and energy release rate, G. Here you got uh, a remote stress, uh, a flaw here, 2A. This is 10 inch. And so what we want to do is calculate the stress intensity factor. So that's basically 2,000 PSI pi, and then we have the crack length, which is 0.1. A is 0.1 here. And so plug it in here. Um, um, I, I'll have to say it's 0 0.01. Um, it's either 0 0.01 or 0 0.1, so I apologize. Just check it. And then you get this value. Then you can calculate the energy release rate based on that. So you find the value of K, but you also find the energy release rate. Uh, so the two values can be found. Remember that G can be related to K1 using this formula, and I showed you where that came about. You can then usually also use the J integral. Uh, so, so again, this is a close from solution. Now using abacus, we can use the J integral to calculate uh, the contour around the crack tip. And so that will give you the value of 0 0.1216. You can also use the method that we discussed earlier, Earlier, increase the crack size by value of A, and then extend it some amount, and then calculate the difference in strain energy. And you can see here that um, the strain energy um, uh, has changed. So then calculate this difference, and then this will give you the energy release rate. And so you can see here that's G, 0.125, which is very close to this value which is very close to the value here, the close from solution. And so I also invite you to download a paper I wrote in, in this paper talks about predicting the energy, energy release rates for bonding decimeter adherent surfaces. Um, and the idea there is looking at how the VCCT is applied, the virtual crack closure technique is applied uh, for a, a fairly, interesting problem. So I invite you to, to look into that. Uh, there are other papers uh, that you can look at that, that kind of uh, show you how this is done. Uh, the method number six, which is really looking at crap propagation, what it really does, it goes back to the concept of Griffith. Uh, Griffith looked at the atomic bonds, and when these atomic bonds break, we have failure. So the idea there is that if you have a spring that connects two two boxes, for example, that uh, when you apply these loads, there's a spring that attached them, and the behavior of that spring is going to follow this traction-deflection relationship. Uh, and it has an exponential nature, so the more you deflect this, uh, the traction will uh, re increase to a peak and then decrease to zero. Uh, the area under this curve is, a, is the energy release rate. So that's the beauty of this, is that you're able, you're able to connect the separation of two blocks with a spring to the energy release rate, and also you're able to, to attach it to some sort of failure metric, strength metric, okay? So that's very interesting uh, to look at. Uh, now consider two plates, two plates, and let's connect them by something called interface elements. These interface elements are a continuous distribution of infinite number of springs they're connecting the top and bottom surface. There are infinite number of them, infinite number of them. And all these top and bottom surfaces are doing, they're actually coincident. I'm just showing an exploded view, but they're initially coincident. And as loading is applied, then the two surfaces can start separating. And when fracture occurs, the energy under the curve is the fracture toughness, or is, or is it basically the energy consumed by separating these two surfaces. So this is very powerful because it's very connected to Griffith uh, approach where uh, the energy that went into failing a spring or the surfaces went into the forming of new surfaces. And you can see here, 
that this is essentially doing that. If I have springs connected from the top surface to the bottom surface, and so that means it's connected to S plus to S minus here, uh, you can see here that, that uh, initially there were incident as cracking is occurring, these two top surfaces are separating. So these top surfaces and the bottom surface are separating. When it, it reaches a critical value uh, here of deflection, then the traction decreases to a point of zero. And when that happens, the energy has been consumed, new surfaces have been created. So that's the idea of the cohesion elements. Uh, and here's a general formulation. If you recall, I went through this formulation for uh, earlier when I discussed Newton's second law. Uh, but in essence, uh, you'll be using a formulation that looks something like that. I don't want to go into details. Bottom line is an energy formulation uh, using the principle of virtual work. So I won't go into that here. It's not my intention. It's just to introduce you to the idea of the cohesion elements. Uh, but this has been used quite a bit. Um, to, to predict fracture. Uh, so I wanna move now into fatigue crack growth, and I wanna spend some time here discussing how this is done. Uh, I won't go into extensive detail because now after this particular discussion, I wanna move to a software that people use to predict fatigue crack growth, and that software is called NASGRO. So I have invited a guest speaker to guide us through that and show us how that that software is used to predict crack growth um, for a fatigue type situation. I invite you to take a little break right now and then kind of return. Um, but what is the idea here is that you have a flaw, you have a structure which has applied loading in a cyclic manner. And recall that we already went through uh, the fatigue discussion earlier, but now we're discussing with a flaw present. And so in those situations, what you expect is that even though the stress intensity factor K1 or the, or, or the stress intensity factor K is not equal to K1C, that there's a value below K that when you apply cyclic loading, the crack will continue to propagate in a stable manner. But there could be a point where the crack propagates catastrophically or unstably. So uh, it's important to understand that that could happen, okay? Um, and so uh, we could go now and look at uh, how to tackle this problem. So the more cycles, the more, more the crack grows, and there will be a point at, in time where the crack reaches the value at which the stress intensity factor equals the critical stress intensity factor. At that point, you have unstable crack growth. And so people have done a lot of testing, and what they found is that uh, most materials, uh, you know, aluminums, uh, titanium, steel, uh, you're going to get this crack growth versus stress intensity factor range data. Let me explain this a little bit more. So uh, this tells me this is a crack size versus number of cycles. So this slope here is DADN, okay? So if I were to plot the DADN, so this, this y-axis is DADN. If um, DADN is zero, then you, you basically uh, don't have a slope, right? But here you have a situation where the, you have this, this continuous crack growth with number of cycles. And so if I take DADN and plot that here in the y axis, and this is a stress intensity factor range. So this is delta K. I'm basically varying uh, stress. Right, so stress is varying, and look at the formula here at the top. The stress range is changing, right? So I have from minimum to maximum, that is changing. And so I can calculate K max corresponding to this maximum stress. and can calculate K min corresponding to the minimum stress. And so with a given flaw size and the geometric factor, so this beta can be found from handbooks because, it, you know, remember the K, Depends on the geometry, the crack length, and the remote stress. So given that information, I can calculate the range of the stress intensity factor. And that goes here in, in, the, in the x axis. So that's going to tell you, uh, for a particular value of delta k, that tells you 
the crack growth rate. Okay, so DADN is really equal to a constant times delta K to the M power. And A and M are material parameters that can be found through testing and that could vary depending upon the environments, the frequency, the temperature, and the stress ratio. And we talked about the R ratio in the prior lecture. Uh, and recall that R uh, is gonna depend upon what sigma min and sigma max are. Here's a much uh, a zoom in view with what's going on. So DADN is a Y axis. Uh, the X axis is delta K, the stress, the stress intensity factor range. So the higher the stress intensity factor range, then the more likelihood of getting into a situation where you can reach KC, the you know, you can get an unstable crack growth. But there's a value of delta K at which, if it's below that threshold, you probably have very small amount of crack growth. But once you exceed this delta K threshold, the crack growth will be a little bit more, uh, will be a little bit more significant. And so this here is called, this one, this area, this region is called region one. And it's a, we call it the microstructural behavior. This is where all this stuff is happening in the microstructural behavior. Uh, and then suddenly, you can have a region two where we call the, the stable crack growth because it's fairly stable, you have a slope, it's not dangerous, so the crack will continue to grow to some level. Uh, it's a macro behavior. Uh, you're gonna see striations. Uh, you're gonna see those striations, those beach sand marks we saw before. Uh, it's gonna be influenced by environments, the mean stress, the frequency. And then, after this point, you get to region three, where you start to get cleavage, inter, intergranular failures, and then suddenly, uh, as a crack grows, you're gonna have an unstable failure. So, uh, something to keep in mind, on the right-hand side, I have a picture that's DADN and Delta K, just to show you that a lot of different materials exhibit a very similar phenomena. This picture came from NASGRO, uh, as an example. It can be found in, one of the FAA documents has it as well. Um, so I'm going to continue here showing uh, the beach sand marks we talked about. Uh, you can see the tintin and titanium. It leaves a visible, vis visible marker from heat uh, that shows the crack growth. And you can see that for surface crack, um, you can see here the, the beach, the marks uh, from the crack growth, uh, the fracture bands uh, there. And then you can see how crack is growing for, uh, for tension uh, versus like you can see crack growth going that direction. And then you can see for bending how the crack is growing as well. So two different scenarios, DADN versus Delta K uh, in, uh, for a particular test that was done. So for example, here on the left. Um, uh, here is from NASGRO. It's a software that's used to calculate uh, the fatigue crack growth. And you can see here test data for multiple materials, and you can see the R ratio, which um, again, uh, this uh, will influence the, the fatigue crack growth as well. And uh, all these parameters can be curve fitted into an equation, which will have C and P, Q, the yield stress, KC, K1C, and all these parameters. I'll be, uh, we'll be going through NASGRO later and uh, Dr. Nardendale, who is the invited guest speaker, uh, speaker, will be going through that. So what is a big picture perspective? The big picture perspective is that you have material testing. So this is your material testing right here that will generate the, this fatigue crack growth. That's a big picture perspective. Then you have, these uh, loading environments, this, this fatigue spectra, this load spectra goes into a, so a stress intensity factor calculation, which depends on geometry, depends on the stresses applied. And then that information is used uh, here with NASGRO or this, this, this curve to figure out how the crack growth is occurring, okay? That's how I use this information, is to, is to generate this curve, 
figure out the loading environments, figure out the best crack geometry for your problem, because the idea is to figure out uh, the loading conditions for your problem, use that information to calculate the stress intensity factor, and then that is used then to proper, you know, to determine how much the crack grows over time. It's a simply curve fit if you think about it. The ADN curve, um, basically, this is the crack growth rate, crack growth rate with number of cycles. You can see it depends on delta K and it depends on the R ratio and the delta K threshold that we talked about, which is right here in this case. Um, so below this value, we see limited crack growth. Uh, just above this value, it increases quite rapidly until it becomes, it, it goes into the stable portion here. And so then you have the delta K, which is also appearing here, and you have K max divided by KC, uh, and then this P and Q coefficients. I invite you to download this document here. It goes into fatigue crack growth database analysis for damage tolerance analysis. Uh, but I invite you to, to, to understand um, uh, this a little bit more because uh, the simplest formula, right? The simplest formula is the following. is uh, DADN A delta K to the N. That's a simplistic formula for this portion of the curve. And it's very easy to integrate this equation on both sides of the equation to determine what the crack growth is over time as you're cyclically loading the sample. So I hope that's very clear. And so now I want to invite you to see a demonstration by Dr. Nicholas Nordendale on how to use NASGIRL to predict fatigue crack growth. And um, he's not going to go into an extensive amount of detail, but I think it's going to be good enough to get you to understand how the parameters within the software work, how the parameter, how the software works in general, and how it can be used to predict fatigue crack growth. One of the things I want to mention is that we, we didn't talk about factors of safety. Uh, but you know, one there's a, there's a, one approach is to apply a factor of four, for example, to the number of cycles. So if you predict ten thousand cycles of failure, uh, then um, you can use that to to and then divide ten thousand cycles of failure by four, and then the four thousand cycles will be your maximum number of cycles you want for your design. So so say it took. 10,000 cycles and the crack grows unstable at that point, then you take the 10,000 cycles divided by four, and then perhaps you can live with 2,500 cycles. Uh, so then you want to design your structure, uh, you know, uh, to either inspect the flaw size so it gives you the 2,500 cycles, or beef up the structure to keep uh, the number of cycles to failure um, to that end. Now, you can also use miner's rule, as we discussed in the fatigue section, uh, in a very similar way. Because you, your fatigue spectra, your load spectra is gonna, may not be constant all the time. You could have multiple load spectra. And so it's important that you understand that that needs to be included in your calculations. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that, say in an aircraft, I have a flaw of some kind, and the flaw propagates over time per this DADN curve. Uh, the flaw uh, will propagate to some level, but it's possible that when you inspect it, the flaw is actually smaller, so you can then readjust the analysis and kind of reset and then continue to do these calculations as part of your, uh, as part of your assessment. Um, and so just keep that in mind. Um, um, so uh, just want to keep that in mind that, that uh, inspections can actually help you to reassess this kind of analysis. So let me turn it over to Dr. Nicholas Nordendale. We're going to have him uh, help us go through this tutorial. I want to introduce you to Dr. Nicholas Nordendale. Um, he has extensive finite element analysis experience. Uh, he used to work for Abacus or Dassault Systems. And um, he also uh, has applied fracture mechanics to a number of applications uh, across the industry. So I thought it would be a great idea to invite him as a guest and have him guide you through um, 
the fracture mechanics concepts using NASGRO, which is one of the software that has been used in industry to assess the fatigue crack growth. So, um, uh, Nicholas, can you hear me over there? Yes, I can. All right. So I pass it to you. Thank you for allowing us to um, come into our, uh, our show and uh, showing us how to do this. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, so yeah, uh, as Vine said, uh, my name's uh, Nico Nordendale, and uh, I'm going to go through some examples of how you use NASGRO, which is a, a commercially available software um, to basically do calculations to calculate things like stress intensity factors and to predict how cracks will grow uh, given uh, known material properties uh, about how cracks grow through that media. So as you see on the screen, this is the, uh, what pops up when you open up NASGRO. Now within NASGRO, there are several different modules that you can open that will do different things. Uh, for example, you can look at uh, NASFLAW, which is uh, fatigue crack growth. You can look at NASSIF, which is uh, a calculator to calculate what the stress intensity factor is of a given geometry and a given applied state of stress. You can use NASCCS to calculate critical crack size. Um, Probably the most common uh, module within that is NASFLAW, which is going to allow us to pick a geometry, material, and applied loads. And from that, it'll be able to iteratively predict how the crack will grow through those applied loads, uh, either until it completes all the loads or until it reaches some form of failure, either through uh, net section stress failure, which would be an actual strength failure, or a uh, crack that breaks through a given geometry, or the really concerning failure modes, which are unstable crack growth, or a stress intensity factor that exceeds a critical value. So we'll go ahead and if I click NASFLAW here, this module here will open. I'll just move this over to the side. So this module here is NASFLAW. And so the first thing that's going to pop up is going to be a selection for how to pick which geometry you want to look at. So if I open this, there are lots of different types of geometries you can look at. You can look at a through crack, you can look at corner cracks, embedded cracks, or some of the most common, which are surface cracks. Uh, surface cracks are what we would typically think of as uh, a semicircular or semi elliptical flaw that starts on the surface and moves uh, into the bulk material. Uh, so let's look at one of the most common uh, cases. Um, uh, this is called SC30, uh, surface crack, uh, iteration 30, is a semi-elliptical surface crack uh, with an offset in a plate. And you'll see here this diagram shows you what the calculator is going to use. So some applied stress, S0, some applied moment. Here is the, uh, the crack front with a known depth, A, and a known width, 2C. And you have the ability to apply a constant stress or you can apply varying stress through your net section. You also have the ability to offset the crack. And these uh, calculations here kind of show the geometric limitations. Basically, uh, NASGRO is a um, compilation of lookup tables. Uh, there's tons of material data as well as calculations for the shape function. If you remember back to your equations of what stress intensity factor is, it is uh, your stress times a geometric factor times the square root of pi times your crack size or pi a. That uh, shape function is what varies as a function of your geometry. So the width, the crack location, the thickness, all of those slightly change the calculation for stress intensity factor. And a lot of researchers over the years have compiled that uh, into peer-reviewed journal articles and textbooks, and so NASGRO compiled all of those. And so those calculations only exist for certain uh, conditions. So for example, you can see here that uh, the crack uh, depth divided by the thickness has to be between 0 and 0.95. If you try to input values that violate this, NASGRO will abort and tell you it can't calculate uh, values outside of that. Let's go ahead and select this it's very common Hey, Nico, Nico, before you go forward, uh, can you describe a little bit uh, uh, how 
what approach do you use to come up with uh, which which geometry is the best for your situation? Like, wh how do you think about that? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So, first of all, it's probably most common that uh, you know you you want to look at flaws either because you have observed a flaw existing in a certain part that you're looking at, or the type of manufacturing that you're doing is likely to uh, is likely to lead to those type of flaws being generated. In uh, metal parts, uh, one of the most common workmanship sensitive uh, processes that can be done on metal parts is welds. And welds are typically uh, more likely to generate flaws because you know it depends on whether or not a manual uh, welding process is being done through a welder uh, or it has a machine that's doing the welding. Uh, either of those cases, the weld is, uh, it, you know, there's variability from weld to weld as you do go through manufacturing. That's more likely to have a flaw in it than, let's say, you know, uh, plate material or forged uh, uh, metal parts, which have much more uh, process controls in place in order to make sure the manufacturing is uh, repeatable and forms a nice polycrystalline material. So. Welds are very commonly uh, generating surface flaws. And so that's why in most industrial applications, uh, there are some forms of non-destructive evaluation like x-rays, dipenetrant inspection, eddy current inspection, uh, magnetic particle inspection. All, all of these different inspections allow for us to either do surface detection, uh, like visual or dipenetrant, where you just smear a dye over a surface and then you use like a black light in order to make that uh, dye kind of pop out at you. Uh, or if you're using things like x-ray or uh, ultrasonic inspection that can go through a solid, uh, those are called volumetric inspections, uh, that can detect things like embedded flaws, things that exist inside that wouldn't exist on the surface. So typically, um, there are standards, uh, depending on the industry, whether it's aerospace, aircraft, automotive, marine, there are standards that will stipulate the type of non-destructive evaluation that you have to do uh, in order to detect flaws and the typical limitations of those techniques for how small of a flaw can they reliably detect. So for things like dye penetrant, dye penetrant inspection can only detect the surface. And so uh, if I'm looking at a plate, something that doesn't have a variation in geometry uh, in, you know, if you look at my cursor in that direction, if there's no variation in that direction, then a plate is appropriate. If I was looking at a tube or a uh, certain type of pressure vessels that have some curvature to it, curvature can have an impact in the geometric factor of the calculation. And so it might be more important to look at something like a semi-elliptical surface crack in a hollow cylinder that's axially oriented or that's uh, circumferentially oriented. There are many options for how you, you know, depending on the geometry that you're looking at. So this kind of just shows for surface cracks, some of the types that you can use. Uh, for any, consideration where if you think that the part is big enough where the geometry isn't really going to affect the solution near the really localized stress intensity at the crack front, then SC30 or SC01 are the most common ones that are used typically in practice. So let's say you select a surface crack and you have these requirements here. First step is usually the simplest, it's just to input what your geometry is. So let's say we have a plate that is a thickness 0.1 inches. And if I want, that's the thickness here, T. Now I'm gonna input the width. And I'm gonna make this large enough to where it's not going to impact what's going on at this crack tip. So I'll just say that this is 10. And if this is a centered crack, B is just half of W, so I'll say this is five. Now, depending on the version of NASGRO you have access to, uh, some versions have implemented the NASA standard based on NDE. 
if you have an older version of NAS Grow, I think it's earlier than version eight, this option isn't there. So you have to input these manually. But essentially the way this works is you have a depth A, and then you have an A over C, which describes the shape of that crack. If A over C is one, then A is equal to C, which means that the crack is perfectly circular. If you do a smaller uh, A over C, it can maybe become more elliptical where the length uh, or the width of the crack is actually uh, longer than its depth. So if this is 0.1, let's say that this is an appropriately small flaw that's maybe you know, 0.01 inches. And we'll start with something straightforward and we'll say the crack is perfectly circular. And we'll say one. And so there's some other options here uh, that kind of go beyond uh, the basic use of NASGRO. So I won't touch any of those right now, but that's all you really need to do at a bare minimum for inputting of the geometry. Hey, Dr. Nardendo. Um, so uh, as an example, I know this looks like a plate, but say you have a cylindrical tank uh, or some, some tank of some sort, like a fuselage. Uh, is it true that I can, I can still use this solution procedure because I could approximate it by the width being very large? Is that correct? Like I can look at it from that perspective, use this simplified geometry for a more complex situation like a future large tank? Yes, definitely. And in fact, I would encourage that mostly because, uh, you know, there are, as you saw, some of the other options that I put in here, there was SCO4 and SCO5, which are for you know, flaws in some type of hollow cylindrical structure, those uh, geometries do have limitations here that control the thickness of the fuselage compared to the radius. And so something as large as like an airplane fuselage or a launch vehicle diameter, something that's that large, um, in those particular cases, you know, where something like thin walled pressure vessel equations would apply, or even just in the case where that radius compared to the thickness is uh, too large, uh, those geometries might not actually be applicable. So in those cases, the curvature is so slight compared to the size of the flaw. And in this case, we're looking at a flaw that's you know a hundredth of an inch in depth. So a radius of curvature of you know something on the order of seventy to eighty inches, you know feet of, of radii. Um, that curvature would have negligible impact on the geometric factor. So it's a really good point. So after you're done uh, putting up the, the geometry, you would then go to the material. So the simplest thing to do is if you know the specific material that it is you have to look at, is to simply click this button to show material list. Now, NASGRO is a really great compilation of uh, strength and fracture and the fatigue crack growth properties as a database. And so there's a lot of different materials go on here. And so let's just look at a common aluminum. Aluminum is really common. So those are all going to be under here, 1,000 through 9,000 series aluminum. And from here, you can see which series you want to pick. So one of the most common aluminums you probably see is 6061. So that'll be under 6,000. You'll see that there's two of them here. And you'll see there's a dash T6 or a deep or dash T651, depending on the heat treat you want to look at. T6 is pretty common, so I'll look there. From here, hey, oh, go ahead. Yeah, Dr. Nordendil, I wanted to see if you could also comment on being careful about, have you had the situation where you have to be really careful about what, what you're selecting? You know, sometimes something may look close enough, but may not be the right option. Could you comment on that a little bit? Absolutely. So uh, in practice, um, these are, good numbers to start with, but in any case where if in practice I had to use this to uh, be involved in an anomaly investigation or a disposition of a hardware nonconformance, something really important, every single time I would run these by a you know, material science expert to verify that the strength, the fracture toughness, the crack growth parameters are all uh, accurate and or bounding of test data of the hardware it is you're specifically trying to look at. So all of these uh, properties will get you, you know, 
close. So if you know the material is 6061 T6 and you're sure that that's the heat treatment, then you know that's you're in the right ballpark. But from here, you can see really closely that the first one is a plate or a sheet uh, where you have uh, you know LT or TL or just longitudinal transverse or transverse longitudinal and lab air, room temperature versus something that's extruded. And you, you see these different uh, extrusion directions. This one is also a weld. So you know these will change the parameters that you're looking at. And all of these uh, parameters, uh, all the properties come from actual ASTM tests that had to be performed uh, under the rigorous ASTM standards to make sure that they're valid. And enough samples have to be generated such that you have an appropriate statistical significance in those values. Even still, uh, whenever you manufacture parts, um, whenever you have hardware that's built, the, the raw stock of the material will come with material, material certificates of conformance, which come from the actual, uh, like the forging houses or the uh, metallurgical houses that provide that material. They have to provide that data that shows, yes, this you know, aluminum meets these requirements. It has these minimum strength, elongation, fracture toughness properties uh, that at least make sure that you're uh, analyzing to the correct values. So for this particular case, if I just click on these values and I say, okay, a number will pop up. Uh, something of note, you'll notice that at the beginning of all of these, there are letters and numbers. That's because when, all the, when I click uh, okay, a specific material code will exist for this particular material. And that code will be M6AB, 13AB1. That is a unique uh, material code that is useful in industry because if I'm an analyst and I'm working with a analyst from a different company or a government agency like NASA or the Department of Defense, if you're trying to uh, validate each other's work and make sure that like if for example I do an analysis and I want to make sure another engineer can get the same results, reporting what that material property is can guarantee that you're using the same one because all it would take is me to have accidentally like extruded instead of a plate sheet and the code would change. So it's a really good way to double check that you're using the correct material property. So if I say okay here, this will autofill all of the properties. And you'll see, just like I just said, material properties ID is right here, M6AB13AB1. And here was the name that comes along with it. Now, I'm not going to get into all the details of this. We, you can uh, go through the NASPRO help manual if you want exact explanations of all of the parameters. But some of the most important ones are the first four, which is ultimate tensile strength, yield strength. Then you have K1E and K1C, where these two are fracture toughness. This is a fracture toughness in a uh, plain strain condition, and this is fracture toughness in the plain stress condition. Um, these parameters have to do with the strength, or uh, not strength, the fracture toughness increase that you can achieve uh, when you go from a plain stress to a plain strain condition, or vice versa. Uh, C and N are your crack growth parameters, uh, where DADN equals C times delta K to the N power. P and Q are transition coefficients that have to do with how your uh, crack growth parameters accelerate or decelerate in zones one and zones three, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, and you have a few other parameters that I'm not going to get into much here. Uh, as far as failure mode, a good practical um, use is to make sure that at least these first two are usually checked. And this is where as you cycle through um, your loads that you'll define in the next page, it will always check the stress intensity factor and the net section stress that is being calculated in front of your crack. And it'll check that against these properties that you've defined. Whichever uh, hits first, which uh, stress intensity factor that exceeds your fracture toughness or a net section stress that exceeds uh, a term called your flow stress, and your flow stress is the average of ultimate tensile strength and yield. Whichever one goes first is what leads to failure. 
Now it's important to know that in practice, you should know that NASGRO is still just a calculator that needs uh, an intelligent engineer to govern what it's doing. There are some cases, depending on the material that you're using, the geometry that you're using, there may be cases where the net section stress uh, may exceed your flow stress and you, the engineer, might decide that that's acceptable. What that means is that your part is yielding. Now, if you're only yielding at a tiny part in front of your crack tip, that may be acceptable if that just means that your load redistributes. You know, we know in um, if something you had like a pressure vessel or a tank, that may just mean that there's a tiny region in your surface that's yielding and the load will redistribute around. That may be acceptable. In that case, uh, with great discretion on your part, only if you understand the physics of what's going on, you can elect to uncheck that. So it will no longer uh, uh, flag a failure in the solution when it uh, gets to that. Now, if you have something like um, a, a beam or a strut or a bolt that has a minimum cross section and it's a single point of failure, you don't want to suppress that check. You wanna make sure that you're checking, hey, have I gone above what this is capable of withstanding and this from a strength perspective? So general good practice is to keep those both checked. Um, and if you're curious about what this data looks like, you can click this box here and this little window will show up that basically allows you to plot what the DADN curve looks like. And there are some titles and limits you can set here, but if you show the default, it looks like this. So this shows you actual test data uh, with the actual curves that are being used. And you'll see here, these are all the, the properties that exist right here. So all these exist up here. And you'll notice for this case, there are three curves and your curves are for an R of 0 0.75, 0 0.5 and 0.1. R is your alternating stress uh, ratio. Basically it's a ratio that looks at the loads that you're applying, which we'll look at at the next tab. Basically, you're gonna have a different amount of crack growth if you cycle from zero to a peak stress and you go up and down from uh, that you know, stress-free condition all the way to peak stress, that's gonna cause a different amount of crack growth than if you start at, let's say, you know, something like 50 KSI and you cycle up to 80 KSI. Going between 50 to 80 over and over and over again is a different amount of crack growth than going from zero to 80. That's because your mean stress, which is your maximum minus your minimum divided by two, those that number is different. So uh, NASGRO has um, different R uh, ratios embedded within the software to make sure that whenever you put in a load block of varying levels of stress, uh, it picks the correct crack growth for that case. Now you'll notice what the plot is, is DADN versus Delta K. Delta K being from your minimum stress to your maximum stress in a given cycle, you have two different stress intensity factors, the minimum stress and the maximum stress. That delta, that delta stress intensity factor is what would be used in this calculator. Uh, let's say um, you were given a total delta of 10. Uh, if your R was 0.1, it would go up here. And this is the amount of crack growth that you got from just that one cycle. So that's part of what makes NASGRO really powerful is that the calculations that it's doing at any one time isn't particularly difficult. The fact is, is that if you have a long enough uh, stress history of cycling through a lot of different stress cycles, through lots of different amplitudes, that's really time consuming to try to manually keep track of. So NASGRO allows you to really easily input what those are and iterate over and over and over again until it finishes the load block that you've defined or until it predicts failure. Uh, so, Dr. Nordendale, um, one more question. Um, if I have my own data, right, um, and my my coefficient n, the, where it says 2.3, my test data said 
I think it's more like 2.2. Is it possible to change that number or I have to create a new card altogether? Good question. So you can input, you can change these as you see fit. If I say 2.2, you'll notice at the top comes up with a warning saying the parameter values have changed from their original material uh, file values. So you can change those. And if you change them significantly enough, um, these curves will start to deviate from the test data. Now, if you have your own test data, you can certainly you know, use these to plot them against your own test data to make sure that you're getting the correct values. Um, and there are other cases um, that may be used to change that. For example, if you, you know, these are the minimum values, but if you know from the certificate of conformance that come from the metal houses that maybe the minimum yield strength is actually something like 43, and that's been confirmed from test data, you can change those as well. So, you know, you're free to change these, but just be aware that making those changes is going to deviate from the test data that has been, you know, calculated from actual ASTM tests. So um, also be aware that if you, when you are done making these runs, you have the choice to save your files. If you try to reload those files, NASGRO will always ask the question, if you've changed these properties, it'll ask you by default, do you want to use the values from NASGRO or do you want to use the values from the input file that you changed? So make sure you know which ones you want to do. If you aren't paying attention to the dialog boxes that pop up, you might accidentally reload a file and have it default back to the NASGRO values instead of the values that you put in. So that's all the minimum you need for the material. The next part is the load blocks. So there's multiple ways to handle load blocks, but fundamentally uh, keep in mind, first of all, that um, you need to note what units were being used. You'll note uh, these are all an imperial units uh, or English units, but these are obviously not in PSI. The yield strength of aluminum 6061 is not 41 PSI, it's 41 KSI or kips per square inch. So that means whatever load blocks you put in also needs to be stressed in terms of KSI. Uh, so if I wanted to apply a single cycle of stress, you'll notice there are two sets of stress. There's S0 and S1. To know what those are in any given geometry, you need to go back to the geometry tab and see what the options were. S0 here is your tension stress. S1, in this particular case, is the uh, moment or your bending stress. So if I were to assume that this plate is only being subjected to tension, and if I assume it's going from a equilibrium state of zero to a total stress, now obviously we can't exceed the flow stress, which is the average of this, so that'll be 43, 43. Um, it needs to be some stress below that. So if I were to say this is 30 KSI, if it was all tension, then I, there's, these would be zero. You can either type these in as zero or you can leave them be. The last thing you have to do as a, at a minimum is your scale factor. Now these values for S0 and S1, these are multiplied by these values. So some people may choose to go 0, 30 and put this value as just one, but it would be equally equivalent to make this 30 and make this one. There's no mathematical difference between the solution for that. Dr. Norland, though, could you comment a little bit about units being consistent with the units? Yep. So, you know, as I was saying, the thicknesses, uh, all this information here was being input in inches. And that has to be the case because, as I said, these are in KSI. Now, there are options here where you can see what those units are. So right now, by default, I'm using inches, inch per cycle, kips, KSI, KSI square root inches. Those are what's being used. You can very easily change 
to Newton, megapascals, millimeters. Uh, you can convert back to, uh, I don't think there's actually a default option for straight up uh, SI. I think a lot of that is because they're trying not to make these digits too significantly long. Um, but make sure you know, you've checked what those units are. Like I said, by default, NASPRO is going to open up in imperial units uh, with stress in terms of KSI. Uh, so you need to make sure that whatever load blocks you put in here are in terms of that. Uh, I'll show you an example after I finish this one where the actual values may not be stress. In some cases, like with pressure vessels, the script actually give you the option to uh, apply the load, the pressure load, directly instead of actually knowing what the stress is, which could be useful. But for this particular case, you can see from this geometry, tension stress is S0, bending stress is S1. Now you'll notice it says S0 at T1 and S0 at T2. That is your min and your max. So your min stress and your max stress in terms of your cyclic stresses. Now in this, this is just one particular cycle. Uh, so if that's all I wanted to do, and I'll come back and show you how to add cycles to this after and, I show. Oh, go ahead. And Dr. Norton, though, just to make sure, right? So one cycle is from zero to 30 back to zero, right? Correct. It's a full reversal of uh, the load. Or I'm sorry, it's a full um, amplitude. So if you look at a, like a sine wave, it goes you know, from zero all the way back. So uh, the next tab is a build schedule. This allows you to do things like, if you know what the service life is of the hardware that you're trying to design, there may be requirements for your standards that say, hey, you have to show that your part can survive two times its service life or four times or 10 times. This allows you to kind of customize what that is. Maybe if there's multiple rows here of, apply one cycle of this, you could apply 10 cycles of some other amplitudes. You can kind of build that up here. Uh, the easiest way to do repetition is to just put an arbitrarily large number here. You can go all the way up to just south of 10 million if you want to. So as it is, if I leave this alone and I make this just one, when I run this, it is literally gonna apply one cycle from zero to 30 back down. Now, that's uh, gonna be the end of that solution. And if it survives, it'll tell me what the new flaw side is from that. So if I wanted to save that and run it, it's just one button. Now, if you wanna save it as an input file, you say yes, and it'll give you an option to type that in. Uh, that opens there. So you could put an input file name here, save and these are the results so this is uh this is just showing you in a window what the results are there is a separate uh file that gets opened uh to to save your output there's uh, dot output files that will save all these results uh, but you'll see here the final results it'll say critical crack size has not been reached which means two things first it means that your peak stress intensity factor did not exceed either K1C or K1E. It means that your net section stress did not exceed your flow stress. It also means that you did not break, this crack did not grow through this thickness. Now, it did grow a very small amount. You'll see, the remember, the original crack size was 0.01. The new crack size from one cycle is 0 0.0100004. So that means the crack only grew, what, four times one, four times 10 to the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the crack growth was extremely small for that one cycle. Now it's very easy to make changes to that. Let's say I wanted to see when this crack actually did something interesting, either broke through or goes unstable. So I might just increase this some arbitrarily large number of times. 
Now see, now from that, it says again, critical crack size has still not been reached. That means that this crack can be cycled 10,000 times from zero to 30 KSI, and this crack has still not gone unstable. Now the crack has grown quite a bit more. Instead of uh, the original crack size of 0.01, the final crack size is 0.015. So we're getting close to thing, you know, crack growing uh, a more significant uh, amount of the depth. I have a question there. So is there a way to, uh, I, I think there's a way to plot the crack size with number of cycles, but also to plot uh, the K, the stress intensity factor in number of cycles, so I know how close I got to the critical value. Good point. So, uh, easiest way to do that, crack size versus number of cycles. You can click crack size and say plot versus N. And if I say show plots, it'll show you here. So this shows you from zero to 10,000 cycles what the crack size is. Now, you'll notice there's two curves here, A and C. That's because if you come back and, uh, let me do that. Um, if you come back and you look at your geometry, you remember there is, the crack is growing in two dimensions. It's growing through the thickness or in the A dimension, and it's growing through the width or the C dimension. So whenever you plot these, it's useful to know which one is growing faster. In this case, you'll see crack is growing faster through the width. Now, th does that mean it's going to go and unzip or it's going to go unstable in that direction first? Maybe. But chances are, in this particular case, A will break through the thickness probably before C goes unstable. So that was how to uh, plot um, crack size, you can also look at the max K or the max stress intensity factor. I look at that as a function of N. This shows you here. Now here, this shows you what we just saw illustrated is the stress intensity factor in the A direction is smaller than the stress intensity factor in the C direction. So yes, given enough time and assuming the thickness of our part was thick enough, eventually the stress intensity factor in the uh, in the width dimension would go unstable first. So that was a simple case of just showing how to cycle a single uh, stress amplitude. Typically, it's not so straightforward. Typically, we might say, okay, there's one case of, you know, going from zero to 30, but there might be a hundred cycles of going from five to 15, or there might be a thousand cycles going from, let's say there was a compressive stress. Compressive stresses do different things at the crack tip. So maybe this was negative 10 to positive 10. Uh, you know, as, we said, as I said earlier, your R ratio, which is again, you know, looking at the DADN curves, there's different crack growth depending on what your load block definition is. All those different load blocks that I just showed you um, had different R values. And so it's going to be different crack growth as it goes through those. So if this is now my service life, this is what this, the part is going to experience. Now, if I try to run this, This runs pretty quick. So it still made it all the way through without rupturing. But you'll notice that this number or the schedule number is now different than the total cycles. The schedule number is defined as this is a single uh, load block. And when I went over here, I repeated it 10,000 times. So if the total number of cycles is what? 1,101 for a single schedule. So 1,101 times 
10,000 should be this number here, 11 million, 10,000. So by the end of 11 million cycles or 10,000 schedules of this load block, this is the final crack size. So lots of interesting thing happening. If I wanted to uh, look at what that crack size looked like for this case, um, you'll start to notice something more interesting happening. So what you see happening here is that this is relatively constant crack rate. But you'll notice that at some point, things start accelerating. Crack is growing more and more and more as uh, it continues on. And part of the reason for that is, is that even though the load blocks are being repeated, the crack is growing. And if the crack is growing, the stress intensity factor is changing with each calculation. So in that plot, um, um, I do want to comment, if you can bring that plot again, that uh, typically, um, let's say in an aircraft design, you will have intermediate inspections. Uh -huh. And so the flaw may be growing, theoretically it could grow from 0 0.01 to 0 0.014, and you can go back to the field and inspect it right at that point, and then you realize, oh, the flaw didn't grow that much, so I can readjust my analysis so that the crack size corresponds to the inspected value in the field. So this is just a prediction, is that correct, Dr. Norton, though? Exactly. Yeah, these are all based off of you know nominal properties. Um, it, it, it's standard in fracture that or in fracture analysis that you apply uh, what's known as a scatter factor to your results because the results are so uh, in, they're so heavily influenced by the input properties that the tiniest changes in like those values of C and N can drastically change your results given enough cycles. And so that's why typically, if you know what the service life is, you typically have to analytically show that you can survive several times that schedule just for a typical baseline design. But yeah, and, and Dr. Norton, I wanna point out too, that that factor can vary from industry to industry. Agreed. So for, for example, in the launch vehicle industry, the factor could be defer from the aircraft industry. So as you go through this, it's important to understand the requirements for your program or whether you're working on aircraft and what are the assumptions that you're using for that partic particular design you're analyzing. Is that correct? Exactly right. So, um, yeah, it's, it's very important that uh, you understand not only what the scatter factor is, but like you said, uh, the initial flaw size, you know, I kind of mentioned at the very beginning of, you know, how do you decide what the geometry of your flaw is? And I mentioned that typically it's one of two things. Either you're analyzing a flaw that was detected, and so you know the size of it, and that's what you analyze to, or you are assuming that flaws exist in your hardware at a smaller size than what you can detect depending on your detection methods. If you're doing an x-ray, standard x-ray equipment has a resolution that goes so fine. And if, you know, luckily I have the newer version of NASGRO and so I can actually look up what some of those are. Uh, if I were to do a uh, dye penetrant inspection, dye penetrant per NASA standards has actually said the smallest flaw that dye penetrant can reliably detect is a 0.025 deep uh, flaw that is uh, 0.2 in the A over C. So that is the smallest flaw that that method can reliably detect. So that means you have to assume that there are flaws smaller than that that exist because you can't detect it any more reliable way. So that becomes what I assume my initial flaw size is. And typically in, in a lot of uh, industries, we assume that that exists in the worst case location of the part and the worst case orientation. So if you have a, a finite element analysis or a hand calc that tells you, okay, I know what the, um, the highest stress or the peak net section stress of my part is, uh, I'm going to assume a flaw is oriented at that location 
such that that stress is going to open that crack. That is uh, the typical standards uh, across multiple industries that we see in order to perform fatigue crack growth calculations. So uh, another question, Dr. Northern, though, uh, if I didn't have, if, 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 the, if the NASGAR version uh, that people may have not, may not have this initial flaw option, is it correct that they could go to the NASA 5009 standard or they can go to some other type of uh, document like an ISO standard that could have this type of information? Yes. So uh, those are exactly right. So NASA standard 5009 or different ISO standards do outline what the standard minimum detectable flaw sizes are for various uh, uh, standard NDE methods. And those were developed across uh, a lot of different, you know, a lot of different industry experts and their experience for uh, what are reliable methods. And, you know, uh, different companies and different contractors buy this equipment to perform non-destructive evaluation. And most of those uh, industries, whether or not they're radiographic machines, eddy current, ultrasonic, all of those uh, different types, um, have their own internal standards to make sure that they can reliably detect smaller flaws. Uh, so those are, um, you know, the two ways in which we typically initiate what that flaw size is. Um, you know, we indicated here how to cycle through these in order to see crack growth. Uh, let's see what happens if we want to actually get some crack uh, acceleration to the point of failure. So I'm increasing this value to be very close to the yield point, which means I'm already pushing this very close to failing uh, pretty quickly. So right there, things change this time. So as you look through this, here are the results. So you'll see it's checking two things, as I mentioned. It's checking fracture toughness criteria, and it says, hey, no failures predicted. But it's also checking net section stress, NSS criteria, and it says failure is imminent. But basically what it's saying is because this crack is growing through this thickness, as it it grows to the thickness, this ligament or this remaining material is changing. Now remember, stress is a you know pressure divided by a cross-sectional area. And so what it's looking at is it's looking at this net section in front of this crack. And as the crack grows, the stress is actually increasing. So basically what it's saying is, hey, this, uh, this remaining ligament is getting so small, the stress is increasing, it's about to fail. And so the final result is it says right here, net section stress exceeds flow stress. So this, if you were to say, could this fail from uh, unstable crack growth or from strength? The answer here would be strength. This was not a stress intensity factor failure. This was it, uh, basically, it was predicting a yield or a uh, ultimate strength failure. And the final results are it failed at schedule number 5350 which means it was in the middle of the 5,350th uh, repetition of this load block when it failed. And this was the number of cycles that it survived. So if your boss or your instructor or anyone were to ever ask, how many service lives can this part safely uh, survive or how many safe lives does it have, it's this number minus one. It safely got through 5,349 and it failed on the 5,350 cycle or, or of uh, repetition of that uh, service life. So that, and then we will apply the factor of safety or some sort of, some sort of scatter factor to that number, right? To that particular number? So that's an interesting point. So I've seen multiple industries treat it somewhat differently. In general, the scatter factor typically says something like, you must demonstrate that your part can survive, you know, X number of service lives. Maybe it's two service lives, maybe it's four, maybe it's 10, maybe it's some larger number. Uh, to me, personally, the most straightforward way of comparing this is saying, let's say uh, I needed to survive 10 iterations of my service life. The easiest way to deal about that is say 
5350 is greater than 10 instead of trying to do a division of uh, it's not so straightforward to write a margin of safety. The reason is because fundamentally a margin of safety calculation is a extrapolation of how much capability you have left in a linear sense. But we saw that if I look at, uh, let's say max K, I plot that versus N, this is not linear. So I can't, you know, saying I have a margin of safety, if, you know, for this particular case, if uh, I were to go and calculate this as, you know, um, you know, 5350 divided by 10 minus one is the standard margin of safety calculation, then this would imply, okay, I have 5,340% margin. But this plot right here shows different because that would imply I have that much capability left at that same level, which would draw a straight line across here. But as you get close to the end of life, things rapidly deteriorate very quickly. So um, my personal opinion is it's much more straightforward to simply you know, report these numbers as either uh, exceeding or being less than your required number of service lines. So 5350 is greater than 10x, then it's past the requirement. If the requirement was, you know, 6,000 lives, this is less than that. And so you'd say, okay, it doesn't pass the requirement. So that's a kind of a quick run through of all the minimum uh, steps in order to get a NASGRO run through. Uh, all the rest of these options here, you can do things like this. Um, so right here, what I just did is I said, hey, tell me what the actual, in a tabular form, tell me what the maximum K value is uh, as it cycles through. And you'll see here um, two columns, K calculated in the A direction and the C direction. You'll see right now, this is what? Uh, you know, 4.7, 5.3. And as the crack grows, these numbers grow. Your stress intensity factor goes up as you cycle through. So it's the same data, it's the same data as the one that we plotted but in tabular format, right? Correct. Okay. Yep. And, you know, same thing. You can look at your crack size um, as well. It's going to show a similar trend. Your crack size accelerates as it moves through here. Now, you know, uh, if you go to your textbooks or your uh, online references, um, <clears throat> they're going to basically break down your DADN curve into three regions. And those are basically division. I was going to look at just the blue curve. Something probably starting around here is where you have zone one. You have some, uh, uh, basically some crack initiation region where it's starting to grow and then from here to the end of the linear portion that is region two and that is sometimes referred to as uh, the linear crack growth region some people call it the paris region where it follows paris law which is dadn equals c times delta k to the n power which you should know is just a line in a log scale uh, where c is the y-intercept of this graph and n is the slope. Once you get above uh, K1C, that is when you have gone unstable. That's when you get into zone three, which is unstable crack growth. So that's when, if you ever see unstable crack growth, it's basically saying, hey, this thing is getting away from you. It's going to unzip at that point. All right, so that is all the basic information that you need in order to run NASCAR. Uh, are... is... Go ahead. I was going to thank you for really going through everything here and providing uh, your expertise so everybody can learn. Um, and I hope that from these exper examples, you have learned how NASCAR can be used successfully to solve uh, fracture mechanics, flaw growth types of analysis. One thing I do want to mention is that uh, 
you don't need NASGAR to do this kind of analysis. If you have the fatigue crack growth and you have the geometries, you can then, for the particular situation you have, you can integrate the equations yourself and calculate the crack growth uh, behavior. But this type of software makes it more handy because it has all the intelligence built in so that you can then use the software and leverage it for your application. Uh, finally, this software um, has been developed by um, SWRI and you can uh, get it from them as well. But the primary thing here is that as any software, it is sort of a black box. So bad input, bad input in, bad output out. Uh, Dr. Narnado, you have some final lessons learned on that aspect, like using software such as this one in a way that can actually come and hurt you if you use it incorrectly. And then with that, we'll, we'll close uh, uh, this particular aspect of this uh, NASGRO uh, tutorial. Yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, one of the things that I uh, learned by, you know, making simple mistakes and having them kind of come back and be revealed is through test data. So uh, as I mentioned, there are a lot of, you know, material properties that are here and very small changes in any one of them can drastically impact your final result. So, uh, you know, whether or not you use nominal or average properties or whether or not you use some type of statistical uh, minimum like A basis, B basis, S basis, some, you know, minimum three sigma properties in order to protect you from uh, that statistical variation uh, will drastically impact your solution. Uh, there are cases where, um, using minimum properties might tell you you can only survive a minimum number of service lives, but in reality you can survive far more because you have safety factors to account for those. So it's important as engineers to think about what your safety factors cover you for. In a lot of fatigue crack growth, we apply scatter factors to the number of service lives that you have to demonstrate you can survive. And that scatter factor is particularly to cover the material variability. And for that reason, it's typical in multiple industries that you actually use nominal or average properties in your fracture instead of minimum properties. So that was a lesson that I had learned uh, uh, pretty early on. Um, other lessons um, that were actually really uh, useful, I'll, I'll just kind of mention it really quickly. Um, one of these, I think SCO4, this was a case that I had learned um, early on. So this is a surface crack in a, uh, you know, like a pressure vessel, a hollow cylinder. In this particular case, there are multiple ways in which you can apply um, the stress. It, in one case, it actually lets you uh, apply the stress in a discrete way where you can basically say, hey, at X equals, uh, zero, uh, the stress is maybe one, but at X is 0.5, we're talking 0.5 through the thickness, the stress is less. And all the way out at the surface, the stress is you know, even less. So you, you can apply these discreetly, or you actually can apply S0 from unit internal pressure. One of the lessons that I learned from that is that when you check this box, it changes what your input is in your load blocks from the stress to actually just giving what the actual pressure is. So in that particular case, I thought I was supposed to be putting in the stress directly, but I wasn't reading clearly enough that what it's asking for is the pressure value itself. So if you know, the pressure in this tube is 500 KSI, or not KSI, 500 PSI or 0.5 KSI, I should not put in the hoop stress or the axial stress, you know, PR over T or PR over 2T. That's the actual stress that is felt by that pressure. And if you check this box, you're supposed to only put the actual pressure value. It will calculate the stress for you. Uh, so that was a, you know, case where I kept putting on the, the I kept putting in the pressure or the, the stress value, not realizing I was putting in the wrong thing. And the 
the part kept instantaneously failing because I was an order of magnitude overloading the structure. So, um, so is it correct, Dr. Nardendale, that I could potentially do some hand calculations too to verify stuff? For example, instead of running this whole thing, crack growth analysis, maybe I go to the left-hand side, this module where it says uh, stress intensity factor solutions, NASSIF on the very left. And perhaps I just do a quick calculation to compare, right, is one approach. Because you don't want to get into a situation where you use the software, you don't know what's going on, and then you mistakenly uh, provide wrong solutions to, to your design team. Very good point. So, yes, th so this was NAS SIF, which all it's doing is it's calculating your stress intensity factor. So because of that, you know, some of this looks similar. Um, but instead, you'll see here, you're just applying the basic geometry, the basic stress. And for that, the only inputs you give uh, is the yield stress, because it doesn't need to know the, uh, th there is no crack growth in here. All this is doing is a simple one calculation, K, you know, delta K equals delta sigma times the shape function times square root of pi A. That's all this is doing. Um, and you, this allows you to put in different flaw sizes, and when you input those, the output will be the stress intensity factors. Um, so I encourage the use of hand calcs um, here to make sure that the values you're putting in are on the correct order of magnitude with what you expect. Uh, if you put in values here and you get a stress intensity factor that's way higher than your uh, fracture toughness, you know that that's going to predict uh, you know, instantaneous failure. So if that's not what you actually expect happening, or if that's not what you're seeing happening in practice, that's a good way to verify if your what you're doing is correct. So that's a really good point. Well, uh, we thank you again, Dr. Nardendale, uh, and please keep safe out there. Uh, and uh, we will continue with uh, the final element tutorial on how this could be applied for fracture. So thank you very much, Dr. Nonandil, and have a great night. Now we're gonna go, now that we went through a NASGRO tutorial, I would like us to go through the fin a final element demonstration uh, with LIFU, and then at the conclusion of that, um, I hope that uh, you learned something about fatigue and that uh, it's clear to you uh, how this could be applied in practicality. Um, through some problems that you'll be working through, uh, I think uh, we'll try to connect those uh, areas for you. Uh, but for now, enjoy the advocate tutorial. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Final Element Method tutorial. Today, we are going to learn how to use abacus to simulate the fracture mechanics and obtain the energy release rate. <clears throat> so here's our problem statement. There's a plate of 10 by 10 inches, and there's a crack in the middle of the plate. Since the geometry is symmetric, we only simulate half of the plate. And <clears throat> the half crack length is 0.1 inches, and the thickness of the plate is 1 inches. Material property is 10 megapsi and Poisson ratio 0.3. The plate is under tension of 2,000 psi on the direction, at the direction of the mole 1 crack opening. And we're going to use two methods to obtain the energy release rate. First, by the J contour integral. The second method is by the <clears throat> strain energy derivative. So we roughly estimate the derivative as the uh, by adding a small change of the crack and then compute the deviation of the string, total string energy. And let's see how do we apply the abacus analysis. Create a part, 3D shell uh, plate. So total length 20 and half of the thickness, so it should be zero minus five to five, five. So this will give you a five by 10 uh, plate. And material property, 
is uh, elastic material property, Young's modulus 10 E6 uh, PSI, Poisson's ratio 0.3. So assign the section, shell element, and then homo homogeneous, and the thickness is one inches. And then assign the section. We don't need to create set down. Assembling, create an instant, independent. And now we need to put it, uh, create a crack in the plate and also for further uh, for better mesh the plate we need to partition the surface use this tools and select the right edge and before we actually do that we can create some point here first point is this point second point is this point now we can create a construction line for later, better to do our, draw our sketch. One is horizontal, one is vertical. Now we can draw our crack. Our crack should start from the very left end and extend by a mount and use the dimension tool to control the lengths. This should be point one. And then we need to draw the contour circle. So to draw the contour circle, we select this end and select another end on the horizontal construction line. Please make sure that your circle, the second point is on the construction line for later, uh, so that later it's easier to make partition. So now use the dimension tour. Let's make a 0 0.02 in radius. So this will be our contour line. <clears throat> so we make another circle. Again, your second point should be on the horizontal construction line and make the radius of this 0.4. So this is just for mesh. Later when you do the meshing, mesh of the plate, the circle will make your mesh looks better. And then for the, we draw a rectangular just for mesh. So use the dimension tools. So this line and this line the dimension for this, let's just make it 0.06. Similarly, this, let's also make it 0.06. And then the distance between the very right end and the first construction line, let's make it 0 .0, uh, 0.2. Oh, sorry, 0.2. So then from this rectangular box, we draw the line that is vertical to the entire plate, just for plotting. All the way to the end, you sh it should show a V here, means it's vertical. And click end, and then use this again, joining this point and some point on the top and make sure that it's vertical. Once it's done, you should obtain some geometry like this. Oh, sorry, I haven't finished the sketch. So if you want to change your sketch, uh, go to your partition, assembling, features, partition, select sketch, and then one thing we haven't done is we need to finish this line from the center of the circle all the way to the end of this line. And since you create a thing, you can right click the features, click regenerate. 
you see that the circle was cut into half. And this is the shape we need for assembly. Then the step, we create a step of general static. The increment, we can do just 10 increment and increment size 0.1 and make it fix. <clears throat> and then in your uh, field output, originally you have a lot of field output, but here, since we are not focusing on field output, probably we just need the volumetric stress and the displacement, U. History output is what we need. So we can create a history output here, which should be related to energy. And inside the energy, choose the ALLIE, which is total strain energy. And uh, originally, we unclick the energy. Instead of energy, we will select the crack. Oh, we haven't created a crack yet, so we'll go back to the crack first and then assign the history output. So in interaction, zoom in a little bit. In your special crack, assign scene and select the one three part that you assign, uh, assume that it's, a, it's your crack. After you click the down button, you should have a dark line here. In your special crack, create the crack from contour integral. Select the integration area. So select the top and bottom circle. And then select the crack tip, which is the center of your crack. And then uh, use a Q vector for the propagation direction. So your crack propagation direction is pointing to the right. So you see a blue arrow pointing to the right. And then in your singularity, since we are doing only linear material property, linear analysis, so we do elastic analysis, so we make it 0.25. If you do plastic, you can make it 0.5. And then single nodes collect element side. <clears throat> now you have the crack, go back to your step, and in your history, out, history output, the first output, uh, instead of energy, we select the crack here. And uh, crack one, N, and then number of contour, make it three, and choose a J integral here. So then we can go to the low part. First, we need to assign symmetric boundary condition. So in your initial symmetri symmetric, select the left boundary. Hold shift, select all of that. And select the X symmetry. Then is the applying the load. In your step one, create a shell edge loading select the top surface. Uh, we can use the by angle and then select the bottom and the top so that you don't need to select four part. You just need to select two parts. And the magnitude, since the shell edge loading is kind of the same as pre uh, com uh, the pressure. So if you want tension, you need to enter minus two thousand here. And the traction is defined on the undeformed length. If you see the arrow is pointing outside the plane, then it's okay. Then it's good. Then go to the mesh part. So first select this three region, because this three region is just rectangle, so you can assign that as structure. And uh, and then select the this four region. This four region are all circular region, so we can assign that as sweep. And the rest is the red region 
is actually between the circular and rectangle. So you cannot use either strap structure or swap for that. So we just leave it free. Now assign global seed. Global seed we put 1.1 inches long. We can see the seed for the circle is too coarse because near the crack tip we want it to be very accurate and more element. So we assign use by age angle instead of individual. <clears throat> and then choose the outer circle and the inner circle and select by number instead of four we actually make it 10. so it'd be way finer here also select this uh, instead of by angle let's change it back to individual now so select this portion hold shift this portion, this portion, and this portion. This four portion should be at the same length. And we can make it by number and change it to five. So that near the crack tip is pretty fine. Now we can draw the mesh. You can see near the crack tip and around the crack tip is actually has way more almond than outside the region. So now we can go to our job and call it plate one. And submit. It, it doesn't take long time since this is just a 2D element. So while it's running, we can go back and change our model. As long as you see the input file was written, then it's good to change whatever you want. So now go back to your features, partition face and sketch. Now we need to for the second method, we need to increase the crack by 0.02 inches, which means uh, the value we enter here instead of 0.1, we, we can delete that. Uh, oh, we actually can select that. And make it closer to the surface yeah I can see that it represents this length and instead of point one here uh, we actually uh, we can delete this one and then redo this dimensions and we make it point one two so two point two point oh two millimeter uh, sorry point oh two inches more than previously can see the circle is moving to the right and then click down and then in your features right click and regenerate the result and it should be here now now since your mesh since your partition has changed so everything need to be reassigned let's go to the crack first assign the scene Seam is automatically assigned from the beginning to the center of the circle. And then in your crack, you can see uh, everything is correctly assigned. Your crack is here, your crack tick is here, and your pointing direction is to the right. That means for your crack, you don't need to change anything. And let's check this, uh, all the step. The step should be fine and the output also should be fine. And your load, symmetric, and the force is also applied correctly. The only thing that matters is the mesh. So you need to assign the mesh again. Now it moves to the right a little bit. So everything is fine, go to your job, 
create a new one called play two. And then submit the result. And now we can see the play one result. Let's see the stress first. One means the stress. You can see the one means the stress distribution, the stress concentration area, the butterfly uh, shape of stress, and the crack opening. You can see here is still a little bit coarse. If you want it to look better, you can make a finer mesh for this part. Here I just want to save the end computational end power. So if you feel like your result offset a lot, you can make it finer. So to show the result, go to your XY data and create a data from the history output. You can see that we have the J integral here and we're doing mode one here. You can see the J integral. And to see the value, we can use the query and then probe a uh, value. Select the ending point, which means the our value for the J integral is around uh, 0 0.113 here. If you make the mesh finer, I think it will be closer to 0 0.12. <clears throat> and let's see from the other from the other direction, if you see the energy, what's the result? So here you can see the energy, total energy. Again, we use a probe value for that. And it gives you 10.0061, 10.0061. Uh, we just use calculator to remember that value. Now we can see, go back to see the one that is has 0.02 inches increment in the crack. So here we create XY data from history output and let's plot the energy and then again probe value uh, for the ending point. This is 0 0.0086. So previously it's 0 0.0061 and that is 0 0.0086. So we have uh, 10.0086 minus 10.0061. And this value divide by, according to the formula, divide by the increment of the crack, which is 0 0.02. Uh, uh, sorry, this calculator will follow the, follow the, uh, won't follow the algorithm rule. So we do 0 0.0025 divide by uh, 0 0.02. So it's 0 0.125. So it's very close to the previous one. 0 0.125 should be a correct value. So but our J integral is a little bit offset. So let's see if we find the mesh, whether we can change it back or not. So go back to assembling as I, the same as what I, we did before. Uh, here, instead of 0 0.12, uh, we delete this one and redo this dimension. Change it, change it back to 0, uh, 0 0.1 and regenerate the features. And in your mesh, uh, can see that it's not mesh now, so just mesh it. And we want it to be finer for all the region that is around the crack. 
So for left and right, we can make it five of that. And for top and bottom, sorry, top and bottom. Hold shift, select top and bottom. We make it 10. And for the middle, for this one and this one, we make it five or even 10, uh, just leave it five. Now we can do the mesh. Now it's finer to previous one. You can see how much you can improve your result. So go back to your job and create another one called plate three. And then submit that. So you can also see the monitor here. Monitor start from 0 0.1 and suddenly go to one. So it's very fast for this analysis. You can try different mesh. So now if you see this, the hole, the opening is more natural, like it follows a natural curve, not like previously is kind of digitized. So if you see XY data, from the field output, oh sorry, from the history output, and J integral for the first one, and use the probe value for that. You can see 0 0.1247 is very close to the energy derivative result, which is 0 0.125. You can even make this more close to whatever you, uh, more close to the actual solution by finer the mesh. So this is uh, how do you apply Abacus to obtain the energy release rate. Hope that you can, we compare the J integral method and the strain energy uh, deriv uh, derivative method and both of them shows the same result. And it's the same as theoretical calculation. And the, the only difference is for J contour integral around the crack, the mesh side uh, should be relatively fine to obtain the reasonable result. So that's all for this video. Hope that you can learn something.